7 p.m., 7.01 p.m. actually, on January 12th, 2021. I am Heather Von Meering. I am the chair of the planning board. Along with me on the Zoom call is Dieb Jurius. He is the vice chair and also secretary for state laws for the planning board. We also have um, Cheryl Wolf, Maureen Meister, and uh, Heather Hannon will not be joining us this evening. Brian Zakelli is on here. He is the host and he is also the town planner. And um, today we have a fairly uh, robust agenda um, for anyone who is trying to join us for the ZBA petitions. Um, those will be coming in after 8.30 p.m. Uh, just so the planning board knows, because we have such an intense agenda today, I do not plan to open up the ZBA petitions to um, discussion outside of the planning board unless we are moving to do recommend unfavorable action or members of the planning board have specific questions for applicants. But due to our schedule, we're going to have to move very quickly through those to hold to our 10 o'clock adjourn time. Also for everyone who is here, as a reminder, we are being recorded. Um, so if you uh, speak outside of the planning board members, um, please state your name um, and address um, when you speak and you are being recorded. We also are also um, located on WinCam. You can find us here after the meeting. They usually record us and put us online where you can get it hereafter, or they also broadcast us uh, currently at the same time on the television on their stations. Going forward, we are going to open up the meeting and directly go into um, the MAPC North Main Street study. Um, if um, it looks like Josh is here, I see him um, on with us uh, to go through that. And then thereafter, we will start our usual updates that we have with the planning board. Uh, Josh has to go to another meeting, so we need to sneak him in before we can really go through our updates of different issues that are occurring with uh, the town. So Josh, welcome uh, to the planning board. And uh, Brian, take it from here. Sure. Um, so welcome, Josh. Um, Thanks for coming. Um, I believe I just, so I just gave you co-host um, privileges. Um, so I think uh, the idea is that um, unless you wanted me to put the PDF up or did you want to go straight in and, um, and introduce yourself and uh, start the, your, uh, your small presentation? Yes, I will do that. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, Josh Fiella, a principal planner at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council I'm happy to be a part of the effort in the town uh, to look at the North Main Street corridor uh, and uh, share with you just an introduction to the North Main Street study so that we can start off on the same page to better, together, get acquainted and uh, get rolling with this work. So hopefully you can all see my screen. Just have a very yep. brief presentation. So my, my information is on the, the screen now. Um, I've been with the MAPC since um, about six years, five years ago, I'm losing track of time in these COVID times, about five years ago. Um, I'm an architect and urban planner, my background. Uh, I've looked at corridors such as the North Main Street corridor in other towns in the region and have uh, been a part of the um, sort of redevelopment, repositioning and revitalization efforts with cities and towns across the metropolitan area region. So if you're not familiar with MAPC, we are the regional planning agency uh, for Winchester and 100 other communities in the greater Boston metropolitan area. And we provide technical assistance uh, to those communities when requested and are, are really happy to, to provide that. So I'm a part of the planning staff there at the agency. So the um, North Main Street study uh, builds off of efforts the town has had underway over the past few years, maybe a little, even a little bit longer. Um, and it really comes out of the effort of, of thinking about the future of the corridor, uh, thinking about potential future zoning recommendations and changes in the corridor and providing some focused planning study to uh, feel comfortable and confident with where those changes might wanna head. So looking at the official zoning map of the town, uh, we're really focused in on that area that's highlighted with the uh, yellow rectangle, uh, which is the North Main Street corridor as it heads up from uh, the town center up to the Woburn town line. And specifically, the study will be focused on the GBD2 and GBD3 uh, 
sections of the zoning. Uh, and that includes 77 parcels, and those are highlighted on the screen, all with frontage along Main Street. I guess most with frontage along Main Street, some, some do not. And you can see those parcels here. So one of the first things uh, with the planning board this evening is just to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of this study area um, and the, the focus of what this work will be looking at. So this is the, the more southern portion of the study area, GBD2. And there you see it, just an overall aerial of that area. And then the northern area as you move up Main Street to Woburn. And an overall aerial of this uh, portion of the study area. So we're, we're just getting uh, rolling now, getting the contract finalized with Brian and, and then on our side as well. Uh, the study will um, shortly be headed into some existing conditions analysis, uh, ex analysis of the existing zoning within those areas I just outlined, uh, and then embark also on outreach and engagement with focus groups, uh, uh, including both the business community and residents within this area, uh, and then preparation for uh, several community meetings over the course of the spring. All of this in order to uh, prepare a vision for the corridor uh, that will hopefully build off of the consensus of what we've been hearing from all of that engagement, uh, and then ultimately prepare a set of recommendations which will focus on zoning in the corridor, but may also include other items uh, such as public realm improvements or uh, walkability and bikeability sort of safety ideas. Um, so that's the overall uh, approach to the work. In terms of the next steps immediately, uh, this evening, a part of this introduction, uh, I'm, I'm giving a very brief presentation because I, I would also like to hear some planning board insights if you have any to send us on our way uh, about how you're thinking of this study and sort of the, the genesis of this work. Uh, we will be uh, we're continuing, we've started and, and we'll be continuing on our information gathering and analysis uh, and then beginning the stakeholder engagement. Uh, we sent uh, to Brian and I think he forwarded along to the board an initial contact list of businesses that we've pulled from the online directory of the Winchester um, Chamber of Commerce. And if you have additional contacts, uh, direct contacts for us, that would be very helpful. We'd appreciate that. Those could be sent by email um, if you have those. And also uh, we've sent a list of potential discussion questions for those conversations uh, as we get this rolling. And if you have some suggestions or, or amendments to those, we'd, we'd be happy to include that as we start to have those uh, stakeholder conversations. And then the last item to touch with you all this evening is that first community meeting. Uh, and on our calendars, we've, we're, we're targeting potentially uh, the end of February or the beginning of March as, as a good time point for hosting that meeting. Uh, and of course, we, we would uh, wanna be a, a part of the, the planning boards um, considerate of your schedule and, and you know, depending on how you'd prefer to approach those meetings, if you'd like to hold, host them in your uh, typical planning board time slots or, or in between them uh, or, or some other time altogether, we'd like to hear feedback on that as well as we get moving. So with that, thank you very much again. And we're, we're very pleased to be working with you on this. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, members of the planning board. So the next step would be to talk about a little bit of uh, insights to this area um, and also uh, any comments or concerns regarding the next steps um, that we are going forward with. Uh, Maureen, I see your hand is raised. Go ahead. Um, so I'm, I was on the board when the zoning was um, prepared and adopted at town meeting. Actually, I was not really involved with Prepra drafting it because I was elected right before it went to town meeting. Um, which was 20 years ago, so I know exactly when it was. Um, I would suggest a few uh, things that could work. Um, there certainly were some flaws in what we did, and there were other uh, aspects that were I understood even then were just incremental with the hope that uh, we'd be returning and re modifying the um, zoning. Anyway, um, I do think, Josh, it would be useful. Uh, there will be some names of people who, uh, you, if you could talk to them about the zoning, because uh, people who are actually involved in it, mostly on the planning board, because um, they'll understand what the zoning, the, uh, you'll get the vision and the goals and the dreams, 
in the you know the real world of people living around that corridor but it, actually understanding the zoning is something most people don't get so i think that you, there's something to be learned from the people who have actually seen what's working and what isn't from the zoning perspective so there would be three or four people we could all be together if you want or you know individually whatever works for you but i do think that could be a very productive um di uh, discussion um the other group that i think uh, i'm not hearing but i would urge you to consider would be the um, his, um, at least some portion of the historical commission. There are historic buildings on the um, corridor and there was a survey done. I don't know if you've seen it or you're aware of it, but it was done through um, Boston University and the, um, the preservation um, studies group there. So um, it was led by uh, Claire Dempsey, who's really uh, well respected and prominent. So um, I think getting those uh, survey forms and understanding what they learned would help as a kind of uh, foundation, um, not just what you're seeing, but actually understanding the history of the corridor. Um, except, uh, related to that, you should know that there's already a demolition permit and it's under demolition delay um, of a building that's really one of the eye catchers, one of the real joys um, uh, that's along um, North uh, Main Street, right at the intersection with Canal. The planning board's quite concerned about losing it. It really is one of the, it's an Italianate building that has a tower um, and reaching the owner is a bit of a challenge, but he runs a restaurant there and he can be located. Uh, so I think that um, how, we, if, if we can save that building, that one's really pretty important. Uh, there are a few others that are just as strong as um, architecturally in the corridor. So, uh, and then last thing would be, you should understand that there was a building that um, actually at the very entrance, you might say, or gateway to North Main Street, um, across from the grocery store. Uh, and that site is now bound, or what, has been closed with cyclone fence. So the planning board um, was not the permanent granting authority on that, but the ZBA did approve a project that looks, I think, by our board's view, quite good. And the abutter who owns um, the wine country um, business next door did appeal. I really think if there are people who, if, if there's outreach, that that's the sort of person you want to talk to because you want to understand what are the what were the frustrations with the project. Um, because as I said, it's not really a, it's not a huge project, and it's not. I think it's um, probably one of the better outcomes we could get for the site. But I understand when people appeal, they're unhappy, and we ought to try to understand what what it is that's driving them. Um, that's it from me. Okay. Um, other members of the planning board. Uh, hi, this is Dave Jurius. Um, hi, Josh. Um, I had um, a really short list of things. Uh, one is that I think you should uh, talk to the town meeting members for the precincts, which um, abut main north main street because they would give you some idea of what the residents are thinking uh, or usually the town meeting members are a little more in tune with town politics and they've usually been on town meeting for a while um the other thing is that if i look at uh, number 12 on your list of um draft questions for discussion and uh i had one edit which is that we are a town not a city and the other comment I have is I think that that is a, is a very open ended question. What is your vision? And I think if there were a more guided set of questions as to what that might be, like saying, do you see, you know, um, bike lanes? Do you see, you know, what, you know, provide some sort of guidance for how they so they would get a picture that they could respond to because it's a pretty broad question to ask someone who hasn't really thought about it very deeply or i shouldn't say deeply but who hasn't sat and thought about it for a while um the other thing that i'm hoping you're going to get to is one of the questions i have is what sort of population density do we need in the adjoining neighborhoods if we really want to turn this into a um businesses which are um, used by the adjoining neighborhoods, what sort of density, population density do we need to have a viable bus business district? Um, one of the things we'd, I'd like to see is that uh, North Main Street become somewhat like downtown where people enjoy walking there and they draw people in from the surrounding neighborhoods because they can walk there. But I am concerned as to 
how much foot traffic do you need in order to keep something going? Um, and that's about it. Thank you, Diab. Cheryl? Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with um, Diab on number 12. I was uh, concerned about the usefulness of that uh, question. And I think Josh, um, sorry, we've never met before, but um, I think that the other questions, um, there's a lot of questions here. So um, I, I don't necessarily feel that one is, um, is crafted in a way that's going to be useful um, to this level of um, investigation. Um, I do um, also have a couple questions on the maps that are here because I, I think it's more the graphics that I wasn't able to read properly, but in the, um, uh, in the parcels um, in each of the areas, they there's um, certain parcels that have a hatch um, on it, a grid. What does that represent? Um, I'm the, the, sorry, I'll, oh, oh, sorry, Josh. I'll I'll, sure. I'll jump in just because I um, I should know this. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, those two areas are known as the Village Center Overlay District (VCOD). These two areas are only slightly different than the GBD two and three. It basically uh, allows for a shorter front setback to promote more pedestrian activity, but that is the only thing that it offers. And that's one thing that they're gonna be looking at because um, it has shown to not produce what the town had envisioned. Um, can I be as bold as to ask what the town envisioned? Um, I was not there at the time. I think Maureen, I believe this is even before your time. No, no, well. no. I was definitely there. <laughs> uh, could you could you elaborate for me? Yeah. Um, oh, it was uh, simply the idea, especially if you know GBD three is ma is entirely residential. So the idea would be that you'd have a, maybe an apartment style building, condo style building, and that it would be. Oh, um, you'd come out your front door and you'd walk down to the little node and it would be like your uh, corner store sort of thing or a little bank at the corner. So the idea was to concentrate a little bit of retail and um, um, commercial and the rest between GBD2 and GBD3 at those nodes, the rest would be residential. So that was all. And so, and it would push up toward the street and the, every place else, the uh, concept was it would be a little bit greener. So um, that was the concept. That's great. That's really helpful. And that makes sense to um, our being a town and um, the interest in the corridor um, from, you know, a suburban town sort of perspective. I think that that's um, very interesting. My, my last question is really just wondering um, about executing um, the stakeholder engagement, um, number three, and uh, the current situation that we're in, as you noted. Um, with COVID is, I mean, I don't know if this normally in your, um, in your practice, Josh, does this take place in person, but now it's probably not going to take place in person. And have you considered the, how that impacts the study from your standpoint and, and also just how these questions might be viewed differently um, based on the sort of economic situation that we find ourselves in based on COVID? Yes, yes. So all of those considerations, we've, um, we are, of course, have been for almost a year now adapted to our, our current normal and um, plan to do all engagement through this process virtually. Uh, so the stakeholder engagement would either be uh, phone calls or uh, Zoom calls if, if the person would like to meet in more of a face-to-face -face setting. Um, and, and that's not that unusual, actually. A lot of this outreach, because we're trying to reach a, a volume of people, would, would not necessarily be in-person interviews, but what would likely be phone interviews in many cases. Sometimes uh, multiple people in a focus group are, is the other approach that we take. Um, in this case, uh, since we are uh, reaching out to small businesses, among other stakeholders, we think it will be easiest and most convenient for those small businesses uh, for us to meet with them individually and set a time up that's most convenient for them. So um, 
that, that will be a part of the approach. I, I think that in terms of stakeholder questions, the idea there is that it's, it's kind of a, a roster of questions to help us uh, think on our feet and be agile in those conversations, but also make sure we're having productive conversations. And we, in many of the cases, wouldn't necessarily cover that roster of questions comprehensively, but would we would be reacting to the types of feedback and conversation that, that the stakeholder is giving us. Um, so that it might seem a little long those questions, but I don't we don't plan to be be overly prescriptive uh, in terms of getting through all of those questions and making it very laborious for the participants. Um, and then in, in terms of co the context of COVID and the um, you know, businesses that, that may, may be under different circumstances or are really struggling at this time. Um, we, one of the thoughts we had, and this might uh, follow, follow, uh, require a follow-up conversation with Brian or, or some others in our agency, is some way to couple this conversation with actually a way to refer um, the businesses in particular to any COVID assistance that we could offer. Um, and that might just be helping them be aware of some, some of the state programs that are available. Um, and, or, and or other thing, things specific to the town. Um, so uh, that, that item requires a little more uh, footwork on our part, um, but I think it would, would offer in, in the ask of getting people to participate in this process, which might not be on you know, their, their highest list of concerns right now, uh, it, I, we thought that it would be a nice way to uh, offer them potentially more immediately useful information. Thank you, Josh. Um, I am going to just add some of my thoughts in as well um, to wrap up the kind of the overview discussion. Um, so I think the biggest issue is really of the cohesiveness of it. So you talk about the stakeholders with the businesses. Dia brought up um, the residents and town meeting would be a great group um, to add to the stakeholder engagement uh, precinct. Um, what is it? Two and no, it's eight and. I wanna say two, but it's not. Um, one, but I, what I'm concerned about is the actual through phase, phase three, I understand, because you can get to them one-on-one -on -one and you can meet with them. The big concern I have, um, and I mentioned it to Brian earlier today, is the community meeting and the outreach. So there's some other parcels that are things are going on with um, planning board, just so you know, and I was reached out by precinct two members concerned about Washington Swanton and that community outreach really needs to occur to a level to really address this, these, the issues that they have and to really be part of it. But we can't, with North Maine, it impacts so many people and so many different areas and businesses and residents. I, how do you, just the community outreach of a group like we had for the master plan or to get people all together and to have the open conversations that you need to have is my main concern. So I see moving through a lot of this, but there is going to have to be a time where we take a break and wait until we can have a really good, robust conversation before planning board, this is to you, before zoning changes can occur. Um, because it really, and how we do that, whether um, on our part, what does that look like and how do we do that? We need to have a better conversation about that because um, I don't want anyone to feel slighted. And there are members of our community who Zoom does not work for them. And um, so I just wanna make sure that we are thinking of that and finding ways to look at that. The, the other question, um, Dia talked about the population density and what do we need to sustain businesses um, if we're gonna zone for them in this area. The question I actually have is, do we currently actually have it? The area that of North Maine and that whole section all the residents off it is some of the most dense area in town. Um, and if we don't have it, the question is, how can any business <laughs> survive anywhere else in town? So um, the question is, do we actually have it? We may actually have it versus um, what do we need more of? Um, the other question that uh, town meeting members are going to ask if we come in with any changes is the revenue base and how this is going to impact that. Um, if we go to more residential or if we go to more commercial, that will um, uh, shift and move things on time because a lot of that comes down to how that impacts it. Um, this, as Maureen pointed out, I would like you, Josh, to take a look at the Historical Commission survey of this area. Part of the reason that we have some cohesive problems is because we do have the historical buildings that are intermixed in there and then the zoning kind of wasn't 
present. Those, some of those buildings sustained themselves, others didn't, um, and it just never was put back together cohesively. Um, and so however going forward and however it's zoned is to make sure that we can rebuild that to what it was, um, not exact, not as it was, but we can rebuild that cohesive nature that this part of the town had. Um, also, my final note is there are some public spaces that are intertwined in there, um, especially at, let's see, it's on Main and Swanton Street. There's a park there. Um, the other question is, is can that be better utilized to bring um, more action and activate the spaces better along there? Um, Brian, I just want to make sure that you have given Josh uh, the previous studies that were done of this area, um, the, the documents for the building that was permitted at the corner near Stop and Shop that Maureen mentioned. Um, 735, yeah, that's 735. Um, I believe it gave uh, also the triangle master plan. I don't believe I've given the survey from Claire Dempsey, um, but I, I have given several or more than several studies to Josh. Okay, and then the final question for you, Brian, is a subdivision that is not closed out, that is supposed to have single family units on Main Street. Um, that was the other thing that um, we can talk offline, but I wanna make sure that Josh knows that there's supposed to be two single family houses on that, that isn't currently have not been built yet. Right, the, par the parking lot there, yep. Yeah. Um, um, okay, though I was just gonna mention one thing, I think in the interest of time, um, not about the study, particularly, but really about the timing, because I was hearing several several different things, and I want to make sure that Josh can leave here this evening with everyone on the same page in terms of the timing of this project. So, Heather, you had mentioned that you would not want to go forward with any type towards town meeting until there could be some type of a, uh, a normal gathering um, for an event. Is that correct? I think that I think that's part of the discussion we should have right now if we feel that we can do that or not. Okay, so I think I think this is the only thing then that we should try to close um, quick, not quick, well, relatively quickly. I think we should try to figure out what the actual timing of this project is. And if we can't figure it out soon, then we'll figure it out the next time. But um, so so. At, at the moment, Josh is on a schedule to go towards a um a uh a spring or fall town meeting this year but in terms of the work would almost be done almost all before spring correct josh before 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 may well no i i don't think we're in a position to do the study in such a way that you would be ready for this year's spring town meeting um i think in potentially for this fall um of 2021 but uh the the, you know, backing up from where the warrant article would close, I just don't think we're positioned to do that. I think, Brian, um, I don't think we'll make it to Springtown meeting with anything from what, what we're going to get. But I do think that if we go, if the planning board is aiming for some um, zoning suggestions to town meeting in the fall, that we could probably go all the way through for community meeting. And then before we go to town meeting with changes, that would be the time where we have a community conversation, hopefully after June, right? Maybe in September, there could be a community conversation, a second one that the planning board manages before going to town meeting with changes. Does that make sense? So we, we have two parts. We have the community meeting with MAPC to get as much as we can, but we need to, before we go to town meeting, we need to have a second one. But that does not have to include MAPC. It's just more of a making sure we keep everyone has everyone has an opportunity before going to town meeting. Yeah, I mean, if we're waiting towards June, then for whatever's happening, regardless of the vaccine schedule, I think people would feel comfortable if we had these two outdoor events. We could have we could have a, a not a focus group, but an actual event be outside, and that could work at Bellino Park. <laughs> Even better. Um, so, okay, so I guess then it's, um, Josh, does anything need to change in order for us to, to move forward on this schedule that's slightly longer than it was previously? Is there anything that we need to do? Otherwise, I think we're all set. No, this, this actually sounds consistent with the schedule. So the, the slide that I had shared in my brief introductory presentation was not, um, comprehensive in terms of this planning study process. There is a second 
uh, community visioning meeting uh, that is a part of this process. And that would be, you know, in the March or April timeframe. So um, we're not depending solely on the one community meeting. There would be two as part of this process in addition to the focus uh, stakeholder outreach. And then um, our, our, with the way the, the calendar of the contract is laid out, we would be then providing a, a report with some of those zoning change recommendations in, in the like May or June-ish timeframe. So, um, which is, you know, kind of aggressive for a process such as this. And, and that would set you up for, for, as you're talking about, potentially then a more uh, public session that's lining you up for the actual zoning uh, town meeting warrant article with, that, it, that would be hosted by the planning board and could occur later over the summer. I think well, that's then, perfect. Yeah. yeah. I think okay. that sounds great in terms of making it all happen, right? So the you got you're getting the planning the planning board insights right now, then going into infor, information gathering and analysis to stakeholder engagement. The community meeting will be um, February March. Thereafter, you'll provide your recommendations for zoning, um, and that will give the planning board time over the summer to work on those change those zoning changes and the language um, to then go to a community session in September for aiming for a fall town meeting zoning changes. And sometimes, you know, as the planning board knows, you do that and then you do the community meeting and they need you to adjust and you wait and you bring it back to spring of 2022. Heather, this is Cheryl. Um, I just wonder about meeting with the community um, in the late winter, early spring, um, considering what we're going through right now and really having the kind of energy that it takes to um, you know, um, discuss something that's not part of a sort of a COVID bubble. <laughs> I'm just, I'm raising the question just, just because, you know, um, we all want to keep things moving. Um, but, you know, the way that we're thinking right now and the way that people are expressing themselves and their ideas, um, it's unique. It's, um, it's not something that, um, that's why my question to Josh was more about, you know, um, about how you see this study impacted by what we're going through as a town, as a, um, as a community, as, you know, socially, um, you know, you're, as a, as a planner, um, how do we, how do we, Put that in perspective and uh, it, it, I'll, it I do think it's more in responding to you Cheryl I do yeah. think the general observation about the town meeting representatives there are quite a few who are right from those quarters so I think that group and also at the end of the day with planning board work it ends in town meeting I think that is one group that could be pulled together in a zoom meeting and they you know, a lot of them are neighbors, they know each other. I think that could work. So that's one that could be done, I think, successfully. Yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe um, very picking um, people very carefully in terms of that, um, that initial um, work or framework. And then I think that's a, a, a great suggestion. I think if I could respond to that too, and with keeping in mind sensitivity to the fact that COVID is impacting um, people in all sorts of different ways and, and unevenly, it's not, not impacting everyone in the same way uh, or to the same extent. Um, what I would say from our planning work that's occurred over the last year, which has not stopped and in, in many communities has continued, or in some cases there are projects which are, have been originated and then now are coming towards a conclusion in this time. Um, the, what we've seen is actually an increase in, in terms of sheer numbers. It might, the populations might be a little bit different, but that's hard to tell. Um, the sheer numbers involved in our planning processes have increased. Um, and so what we're seeing is, is that the virtual meetings, while they do have certain shortcomings and people might not find them as, as a sort of engaging or community building as an in-person meeting, do have their benefits in terms of those numbers. Um, so that I, I wouldn't I wouldn't feel too um, apprehensive in, in that regard, um, and I and I know that um, I'm I haven't done one of those processes in Winchester, so I'm sure that you all uh, over the past year also have done your own processes and have 
uh, more uh, Winchester specific insights into how this has been for people. Um, but, but I would just say that in general, we, we've been actually heartened by what we've seen for the rates of participation. I think Cheryl too, that's also why I wanted to make sure there was more community meetings before it actually went to town meeting. Um, but at the same time, even when we go, usually when we go take things to town meeting, they get, if we went and we had the community meeting and came up with some ideas and started drafting them and had a session in September, we still have to have a hearing before town meeting and we only give recommendations to town meeting. We actually do not have any authority on those zoning changes as town meeting. So it's kind of, it's almost like it's a double check from what I'm, why I'm recommending coming back in September to the town is a double check to make sure that we are still, that, that everything that was gathered and the information is kind of consistent and still going forward. Um, we could freeze the process and not do it. It was, um, Brian and I talked about the state, it was an appropriation that we were given by town meeting. Um, but I don't think that benefits right now, given that we are seeing a lot of, um, we have seen a lot of development proposals coming in this area. Even now during COVID, there's a development coming in. Um, so I think it, I think we still should keep moving forward, but I, that's why I definitely want that session in September. And if needed, the planning board needs to analyze that and say, okay, we are still in COVID. We're still, you know, things are getting worse instead of better. And then that needs to be analyzed by the planning board. Uh, to make sure maybe we need to keep keep doing more community conversations before we bring any recommendations to town meeting but town meeting is expecting changes in north maine yeah it's just the commercial sector that concerns me and um and people's um sensibilities about that but i think um if based on what i'm learning from everybody um i i just needed to ask the question I just want to, before we close up here, I mentioned, um, Brian, could you just show Josh, not in this meeting, but the project, the proposal that came in for the Meineke site? I think that'll give Josh an idea because it's so concrete about what we're facing with the current zoning. That shows you what the zoning is delivering. And um, between what comes in on the Meineke site, which was, uh, it got a like, and by the way, of course, the planning board's not special permit granting authority, it's the zoning board. But every board that reviewed it and made recommendations said, no, this is not good. So, um, but we've got to figure out a way to get better projects coming in. So that uh, I want, I do hope you see that. And then the other document, I don't know, Josh, have you seen the, um, the uh, 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 man, the regulations that go with our uh, CBD zoning? You're muted. Sorry, yep. you're muted. Yep. Yes, I do. I do have those. I have not re reviewed them in detail, but I do have those. So I think there's just generally always some benefit to working with uh, any doc, anything that's working already in a community. And I do think those are working quite well. So I do think that we're going to want to use those and refer to those as a basis or foundation um, if we want to bring something like that in. Again, those would be then the support for the Zoning Board of Appeals as the permit granting authority. But right now they are not referring to those um, regulations because they're just for the CBD. But I just wanna make sure that's um, parked in your, uh, in, your, in your mind as a, a place to, uh, as a starting point. Thank you. So um, Josh, um, how long, so we'll see you next after you start, after phase two, is that the plan? When is the next time that we will see you before the planning board. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to coordinate with Brian and um, come give progress reports to the board as often as, as you would like. I don't think particularly under these circumstances, that's the other benefit is hopping in, in for a meeting is not very time consuming from my perspective. So uh, whenever you'd like, I'd be, I'd be happy to provide an update. Um, if, if we're headed toward, uh, it also depends a little bit on how much, I guess, oversight the planning board would like of this process. If if you would like a meeting before that larger community session to both hear a progress update and maybe get a preview of what we plan to present, that would that would be perfectly fine as well. Um, but we can uh, I, I will follow your lead in terms of how how frequently or, or what sort of milestones you'd like to see me. Um, that sounds good to me to meet um, before you go to that community meeting. Members of the board, did you have points where you wanted to get updates, specific points through the process?
and then there's silence. <laughs> I'm trying to think <laughs> of something to say. I, I, I would, um, I would like to see some progress reports before the first public meeting. Yes, but I assume that we'll be getting something, and I'm ready. I'm willing to wing it. How's that? All right, so you'll be in, in touch with Brian. Thank you so much, Josh, for your time and for your um, your preliminary overview. And we look forward to working with you going forward. Uh, North Thank North you all. Study. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Josh. You Have a good night. You as well. All right, moving onward on our agenda, planning board. So we have, um, is Sean Lyons here, Brian? Uh, Brendan Lyons Brendan? is here. Yeah, oh. and um, I'm here, and Sean as well. Oh, or is it is Sean that, and Brendan? Are you, How so you doing, guys? Let's quickly go to 88 Harvard, and then we'll do the updates thereafter. We'll just stay in the order that they are listed on our agenda. Um, thank you so much for coming, um, Sean and Brendan. Um, so for everyone who is joining us and listening in, Sean and Brendan own 88 Harvard Street. It is a historical house. Um, and we have been talking to them about using um, potentially the new zoning that passed with town meeting in the, I wanna say the spring. Yes, the spring, although it was almost summer, um, to uh, restore 88 Harvard Street and then build a second unit, um, whether it's a house or, um, so I'm going to let them turn over about kind of what their concept is. And I believe planning board the idea is just, um, are we in support? Um, are we encouraging them to proceed as they have are proposing? And that's really what they need from us at this point. And they're not looking for, you know, it's just more of a, we ha you have our support or not um, going forward. So Sean and Brennan, take it away. Okay, originally we were gonna knock it down and put in a duplex that you kind of, your typical duplex that you see all over the place. And uh, in the process, we got held up and uh, when we started about, time goes by quickly, a year or two ago um, with Winchester again to put a, a new duplex there and knock this one down. We were told that uh, this is a historic building, site, house, what have you. And it has significance with the black community and all this other stuff, which I knew nothing about. So as time went on, uh, the people wanted me to keep the, keep the, um, the house more or less the same way it looks. They wanted to re get restored. And I says, you know, if, if anything can be done, I says, I says uh, what do you want to do with the lot next door? I says, why don't you let me build two of them that look side that look alike? So what we have done is we have plans on uh, taking the existing house. It's already been stripped on the outside because it has asbestos on it and uh, restoring it. Um, it's going to look almost exactly the same it's gonna have a little addition on the back um and that supposedly is going to make the town of uh, the town of winchester happy meaning the historic people and what have you and i i also had another set of plans the exact same set only brand spanking new of a house that would go right beside it you can see there's a large lot beside it um so basically what you people have to tell me is do you want me to go forward with repairing the existing house that's there with the plans that i have that you should have to also and building one right beside it that looks identical or repairing the one that the existing house that's there and putting a single house a single family house beside it that would naturally have no historical or black significance does that make sense am i explaining myself okay yep so you're yeah. asking us if you want to restore the existing house and duplicate it in the extra lot or restore the house and do a single family next to it right yep very clear thank you very much members of the board um i um hi thanks for coming in uh this is deb um i had a quick question for you in terms of the Addition on the back, how far away from the property line would that be? Uh, good question. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, you know something? You got me at a loss. Um, okay. I'm, let me put it this way. 
if um, I'm sure if it doesn't meet setbacks, we'll change it so that it does meet setbacks. Um, I'm, I'm not into waiting two years going to all these variance meetings. That's not my that's not my uh, that's not my thing. I'm too old. Yeah, I understood. I was just trying to get a scale of, of how this fits I, in the law. Yeah. From from what I understand, it meets all your setbacks. Okay. Um, and I should know. I you know something? I should know that answer. And I don't. Yeah, point. but it looks like that from the plans, it's going nine feet eight inches. If the addition is nine feet eight inches. Okay, right. that's why you are there to help me out with my answers. Well, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. But that, that doesn't tell me where the where the where the property line is, unfortunately. Do you have any paperwork? That's a that's okay. It's fine. It's it's a minor detail. Um, I'm 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 more than sure that I don't have the exact answer for you, and I should. I apologize, but nine feet. Um, I, I assure you that if you if if it doesn't meet the proper setbacks in the back. Um, Oh, I'm more concerned about having some backyard space more than the proper setbacks. That's really where I'm coming from, is that um, I, I just like to, I, I come from a place which has yards and I want to make sure that there are yards there, um, usable yards. Um, and then um, my, my, my if, other if question. You, if yep. you look up, if you look up and down the streets, the lots are pretty small. Um, and if you would have, if you would allow us to continue uh, I believe that we'd have the yards that are pretty comparable to everybody else, if not bigger. Okay. Um, and so on the, the lot that's next to it, um, if you were to put in, I mean, that's a substantially larger lot, isn't it? Well, it, in reality, if we were to do two of them side by side, the existing one and one beside it, would take that lot line and would split it and, and move it over a couple of feet so it, they'd be equal. Yeah, excellent. And that would make sure that there's a little bit of elbow room next to the- uh, Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. if you look at the existing house, okay, and, and you look at it, you know, from looking at in the street, looking directly at the front, the driveway is on the um, left, okay? And there's only a couple of feet on the other side. And actually that lot line has to be moved over and everything has to be, uh, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, that would that would be good. Um, okay. Um, to be honest, if I if you were to ask me personally whether I would go for a, a duplex or a, a single house in that area, I would go for a duplex. Okay, let's stop right now. We're going to stop the meeting. I'm going home. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, only one, I'm only one like person. You. <laughs> you're, only you know one something? Person. You're on my Christmas card list or Hanukkah uh, list or whatever the hell we do today. <laughs> Um, Maury? Um, well, I want to begin by saying this is a um, zoning bylaw that uh, relates to historic preservation. Um, Brian, can you enlarge the, you are now on the, uh, the neighborhood um, plot plans, but can we go back to the vision of the house? So I don't know what just got ripped. Um, did the cladding come off? I'm, not, I'm sure did, I don't, I don't, right? Is the siding still there? No, it was asbestos. Oh, that, no, the top, okay, so the top floor, that has these um, shingles. Those were original shingles. Those weren't asbestos. Correct, but I believe there was asbestos all over them. Oh, but are the shingles still there? Yeah, but I, I mean, ye okay. yes. I okay. mean, no, but... No, no, that's enough, that's enough. So I want to zoom in. Brian, can you go in here? There are a few distinctive features. I went with my husband. There's actually an article. I don't know if Brian shared it with you, but it's on a state um, web. It's a state website about the street and the preservation and the flexible zoning. Um, so there are certain features of this house that are distinctive. Um, the light isn't very good right now, but the um, the in the gable right now there's what's um, it's a shingle that's in a kind of it's called staggered is the word. And it's like a scalloped the, shingle. I, yeah. 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 Um, it's more like a sawtooth, but I'll go with scallop if that means something to you. But they're staggered. And uh, I'm sorry, this picture doesn't seem to highlight it very well, but it does show up up and down Harvard Street and actually on Irving Street as well. So it, those shingles are one of the distinctive characteristics of this house. And that's something to be preserved. Um, another thing that's distinctive is this railing. And it's pretty simple. It can be either preserved or rebuilt as it is, but you'll find it up and down um, Harvard Street. You'll also find some examples on um, Washington Street. 
Um, there's a red house on Washington Street that I've been noticing. It's very similar. And if you were, for example, to look at the house on um, Washington Street that's like this one, you can see what the post of the porch uh, would have looked like. All of that's to say that this is a preservation project. So we're going to be, um, for the opportunity to build on this additional lot that we expect to see this preserved. So um, that will require working with an architect who has experience in preservation. Um, you're working with somebody anyway. This is not going to be some huge expense. It's not, but you do need somebody who knows what the historic fabric is of the building and then also works to retain the historic features of the house on the outside. So when I see the um, drawings here that we received, th thank you, Brian, that's good. Um, when we received the drawings, I saw, for example, on the left elevation, it's a lot of blank wall. We don't wanna lose those windows. And to the extent that I look at your plans, we shouldn't have to lose the windows. They, you can uh, develop a plan that works and retains the um, windows. Um, it's just, it's a much more, um, what, attractive looking building to have the windows maintained as part of this historic house. So now, um, so I'm going to encourage you, you do need an architect and what you've got submitted to us is just not going to make it through. Um, when you, if you want to stick around and look at our other special permits for just normal projects, not even with this, uh, I would say, uh, relief on zoning, but normal projects, a lot of the people in town are going to local architects who draw up their plans before they present them for the special permits. And you'll see that in our meeting, um, in not too distant, um, not too far away in, the, in, in a few more minutes. Now, separate from this, uh, if you, when we contemplate what goes in next door, we do have to con, um, consider where the parking is going to go. And it's for that reason that my own um, inclination is that we're going to end up with a, a, single, um, a single household uh, building, not another duplex. It's all about where the cars are going to land on the street. And I just don't know if we can make it all work, but that's gotta be considered. One way or another, you do need an architect. And I wanna make the uh, words registered architect um, something that you're paying attention to because the registered architect is the one who's the real architect. It's like a medical doctor. They're the ones who actually have the study and um, have gone through the exams and they'll produce the kind of design um, that we're going to look for, again, for this um, opportunity to build more densely than is allowed by right um, in our zoning. So. Um, we're looking for some kind of design on the adjacent lot that's attractive, that's going to meet the standard that we'd like, the highest standard of Harvard Street, and there's some lovely houses on Harvard Street, uh, and that complements the existing house. But we got we got to figure the architect will work on this somehow. The um, parking has to be accommodated. So for that reason, I'm I'm guessing that it would be a single house. I okay, can I may, may I may may I may may I. Um, Heather's in charge. Um, what do you want to? Can you just wait and let um, Cheryl speak as well, and then I'll and forget what I'm going. I'll forget what I'm going to say. I'll say all right. Go ahead. Okay, I, 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 I'm well. I'm well aware of the uh, the veneer that you want to keep. Um, when I met with the people out there, they they pointed that out to me. The veneer and the front porches, uh, front porches, front railings are very very important to them, and I completely understand that. Uh, the windows on the side, that's I don't understand why they're not there now, but that's beside the point. So my point to you is, if we're gonna restore that, we're, naturally it's gonna be, you're gonna get a plan um, that, that shows every single little detail, and I don't expect to, anything to go forward unless you're satisfied with that. But as far as the parking goes, right now you have, uh, uh, spots on the left-hand side of the existing house, and the lot to the right hand is is bigger than this lot. So you duplicate the exact same foot, exact same house, in the exact same parking. So you'd have two of them that look exactly alike. Th that that was my plan. That you know what I mean. That's all. So we understand. I, I, I get what you're saying. So right now um, in this neighborhood, it is very common to double park and to park in front and behind cars. 
Um, so I understand what you're saying is that you're going to continue that same style of parking. Um, right. There's enough room on the left-hand side of that house to pack two cars side by side. So you can have t on the left-hand side of that house between the stockade fence and, you know, cut down the weeds naturally. You have a, a, enough, you have enough width there to put two cars side by side. If you go into the, into the side yard deep enough, you can do two cars and two cars tandem. Um, I understand everybody likes a yard, but everybody today likes their cars too. So, and then you get plenty of room for yard space. So what I'm trying to say is I, I duplicate the exact same thing next door, move that, move the, move the, um, the lot line over to the right and make both lots equivalent. And so, you know, you'd have, as, as we're looking at it, you know, you have the stockade fence, you have two to four parking spots the house, then you have a small side yard, that's the first house. Then you'd have a lot line, small side yard, excuse me, uh, your, your parking spots, the house, and then the trees. Thank you. Cheryl? Um, no, I don't really have any comments. I think everything's been covered. Um, so I'm just going to chime in with uh, my 10 cents, and then I think you'll be pretty happy. So, um, yes, Maureen is correct that your drawings as they currently have wouldn't make it through the process just because you need to show um, the shingles. You need the railing as it is um, to be restored or replaced in like and kind, uh, the wide trim around the windows, right? So all those things you're missing in your drawings, but... Um, if your intention is to restore the building with those things in mind, as you said, then there shouldn't be a problem. Your drawings just need to show it. Um, the parking, as you said, I have no problem with it. Um, just as a reminder, um, as you go through this process, and Brian can also give you the information, is that the width of the driveway at the curb cut is going to be narrower, but then you can widen up to get those two spots um, if you need. Um, and then I am absolutely fine with a two-family next to it that is in the same that is a duplicate of it, either it's mirrored or a, a, the same. Um, so I am fine with that, as long as you just get your drawings to show that railing, um, show the wall uh, for the railing above um, with, uh, with an outlet for the water so you don't get the mold up against there because the water can't drain. Um, but all that stuff that um, you're missing from your drawings, if you can get it in, I am good to go with that. And I am, if you, and then um, the lot lines, moving that lot line, I am in favor of that as well to give more of a side yard to this property, which is 88 Harvard. Um, and then there's plenty of space in the next lot over um, for this to take a two family and then the parking that's required uh, in tandem. So that's where I'm at with it. And um, I think you're on the right track. You just need to uh, tighten up those drawings. So, so, so what you want from me is much better drawings. I get that. And you want me to duplicate it on the lot and then give it to you for feedback. So it's Maureen. Um, I just I see this elevation of it says house twelve dash zero zero B. It's it's just not the design we are going to be looking for. Um, it, again, if you end up with a red, if you can, uh, you do need to hire an architect. Um, that's uh, what I would describe as a classic sort of spec builder design that we see around town. And we really, I mean, you know, we get those, but they aren't through special permits. But once we get into special permits, we are trying to elevate the quality of the work. And we'd like to have this enhance the um, Harvard Street. And I think you can do it. But um, I don't know, Brian, can you bring up, do you have that one? So the rest of the board can see it? Sure, hold on a sec. Maureen, isn't that for the single family? That's for the single family, Maureen. We're saying that we want them to take right, but Harvard I think with the same finishes as it currently is and duplicate it. Well, if it's actually duplicated, but anyway, the, you get the point, which is what this, I mean, even if this were a duplex, this is not the kind, of, we really need an architect who's going to design it. Um, it will look a lot better. Um, right. also, just yeah. so the board knows if he duplicates it, he cannot duplicate that railing because it's a brand new building and that is a historical, which currently doesn't need new building codes. So just so you know, the railing would be coming in differently on the new house, but I don't think that is an issue from my perspective. I, I think you could design a very similar ra looking railing if you just, I've seen it where they've just put a, a section on top, which brings it up to the right height for code. Right. And it yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah I, I, I believe the railing that's there is rotted. 
and when you have to put a new one in, you just have to fabricate it so it looks the same. That's right. And, oh, yeah. And, and, yeah. In doing, and in doing so, hopefully the architect, not me, and I do agree with you about the architect, can also make the railing look the way it is and somehow bring it up to code. That's right. You're right. It, it, that should be fine. Yeah. Um, I do have, if, if I could ask one final question, or for me at least, is that your, your drawings show a staircase, an exterior staircase to the second unit coming off the side of the building. How does it, where is the staircase now to get to the second floor, to the you second walk, unit? In the existing house, you, you walk in that front door. Yeah. And, and, and there's a small, and there's a staircase um, right there. Okay. Now, there's, again, you know, um, you know, the staircase is narrow and it's steep and it's... it's oh, yeah, steep. yeah. No, I understand that you need something a little better. It just, um, it, I was just surprised. Didn't know how they got up there. Okay. So, 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 so I, I completely get the architect, not a problem, no problem with that whatsoever. But what what I'm trying to do is 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 eliminate the time and all the other stuff that goes along with it to have everything done by an architect and then come to a board and say, well, you know, we only want a, we want a single here, not a two family. We want this, not the, not of that. I think Hello, you have the support. Right there. Yeah, I think I, you do have the support for the two family. Yeah, okay. I think the two family is fine. It's mostly. That more to Deb's point, he's talking about the backyard, but I think in general, we don't want to lose the um, some green, uh, meaning planted area, uh, between the two front there, well, it's the front yards, but also what's between them. So um, the paving is what kills these neighborhoods, and we don't want it just to get paved over. Well, I, you know, whether the driveway is, you know, 20 feet long or 40 feet long, I mean, I don't care. I mean, but you know, most most people love their driveways. Not if they have to shovel it in the big storm. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> no, I know, I know what you mean. I'm just, but I I think the shorter the driveway, the less hardscape. You know, we're not talking about the in the in our discussion today. We're not talking about the hardscape, but Maureen's just putting up a point is when you go and you do lay it out, you will have to come in with a landscape plan look at the hardscape, make sure you're not covering the site and you're leaving a lot of green space around both of the houses. Obviously on the left side of 50 um, Harvard, 55 Harvard, you will not have much green space because you have the tandem parking. You'll also probably have the same situation on the other house on one of the sides of that land. But on the other side, you'll have green. And then right, but, have green. But, uh, but behind the driveway, you have green. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the lot's deep. You've got plenty of room there. Yeah. The cars still have green. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see a problem with it. Uh, to be honest, I think, I think, what what's possible on that lot is, I think you're gonna, it'll be fine. So, I mean, I don't know. Does the board want to take a vote to provide some assurance to Mr. Lyons that we we are happy? I will with entertain a vote if someone wants to make a motion. Can uh, I ask one quick? This is Cheryl again. Sorry, I didn't take my time earlier, but um, a question to. Um, the applicant are are you talking about two cars or four cars i mean if you've got a duplex here are you imagining two cars per unit that's my question okay. Cheryl. On, thank you on, yeah on the on the existing house on the left hand side yeah you'd have you'd have a, um a, a, a two car width driveway the question yeah. is do you go back 20 feet so that each unit has one spot or do you go back 40 feet so that each unit has two spots right and then you're the full you're the full depth of the house at that point right um pretty much pretty much well yeah. Uh, I, yeah i don't think you would be able to get your staircase that you're showing in but i mean based well, on what i'm looking at right now in terms of width but you're going to widen i don't know i i you know there's a lot of landscaping and um and planning to do as Maureen and everyone has said in terms of the architect and and the lot. So, so, so to answer your question, every unit would have one parking spot or two parking spots, depending upon how big you want to do the driveway. 
what are you proposing? I didn't even think about it. <laughs> well, that's why I raised the question because in the end, you could, if you have a couple, and let's call it a young couple even, um, if it's a single, it won't be an issue, but you could have young, I like young couples, right? <laughs> but uh, you've got two at the bottom, uh, first level, and sec two more on the second story. And then if we're putting in du a duplex uh, next door, and you've got twos and twos, you're trying to get, that's a lot of cards. And we do have, um, maybe Brian will help you out outside of this meeting. But there is a limit to how much we pave over. We allow pave. This is under our zoning generally, not just for this project. But we want how much we allow um, pavement over the entire an entire lot. So and uh, not, a right, not, not a problem. Right. Not a problem. In this, yeah. not a problem. So you give each unit one parking spot. I agree. And what happens then? What happens after they move in? Well, we all would know what happens after somebody moves in and they want bigger parking spots. When they when somebody moves in and they own it or they rent it, if they want green space, they they leave it green. If they want hard, if they want more cars, they they dump a bunch of rocks over it. I mean, people That's are going right. to do what people are going to do what they're going to do. I mean, you know. <laughs> so, so the consideration maybe then is that you mirror um, the other house instead, of, in order to create a green space that can be maintained, um, rather than um, ending up with, um, you know, driveway, driveway, and um, you know, I would say that 88 Harvard is going to end up with no green space except at the back. No, uh, no, 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 no. You can have green space in the back of the – on the left-hand side, you can have green space in the back of the driveway. You can have green space all along the back, and yeah. you can have a green space up the left-hand side because the lot line is going to be moved over, and both lots are going to look identical. Correct, but then you're going to have parking on both sides of this – this house that I'm looking at right now, right? No, that's no, that's not the way. That, let me put it this way: that's not the way I would instruct the architect. So okay? you're talking about mirroring, so that the, that the windows on the right hand side of the house I'm looking at would be looking towards the windows on the house next to it, not looking at the cars next next to it. No matter what house I'm in on Habit Street, I look out the windows, I see green, and I see cars. <laughs> True. I think what she's recommending is you mirror 88 Harvard yeah, Street with the new one. Again, again, if 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 you give me the green light to 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 do what I to do put to to, to put two of my exactly identical, one brand new, one rehab. Yep. I will I will go ahead, get everything going, and, and give the plans back to you so you can either tell me how much you love them or rip them up in my face. Um, did uh, don't be bashful. Did you want? Deb, um, we're running out of time on this. So, did you? Um, I know you're talking about a motion. I'm happy to yes. have one. I, I want to. I want to uh, move that the planning board um, recommend that the 88 Harvard Street lot be. Uh, yeah, I have a motion. I just can't restored. say it. Restored. Restored, and that a duplicate structure be placed on the new lot to its right and that the lot line be moved to provide an equal area between the two lots. And Sounds whether good. and whether that new whether the duplicate structure is mirrored or has the exact same orientation is something I think I would like to see whether it makes a difference. Um, but I don't know how the rest of the board feels. Well, I think if there's a registered architect, I keep saying registered architect, um, that it, the, the, net, the duplex, if we're going to go with a duplex, which certainly gives Mr. Lyons a bigger um, opportunity to, you know, sell and make sell two units. Um, if we're going with that, I think the architect ought to have some flexibility here. I don't mm -hmm. think we have to necessarily mirror it. There may be other advantages, as Cheryl said, to moving windows and so on. So it's got a different, it, it could have a different look. Okay, well then let's leave that out of the motion. So I, I think my motion was uh, rehab the existing structure, move the lot line so the lots are equal, and duplicate um, the existing structure on the new lot. Well, that's the point that I think we're welcoming a, that will open this to a duplex. 
as long as it's a design, I keep saying, because we have not seen any work here from a registered architect. I just want to be well-designed. Um, that's the main point. But, but Maureen, if we're duplicating the exact structure. That may not be the, in the best interest for the residents of these units to duplicate it. Well, let me put it this way. Let, if, if you guys are open-minded, that's fantastic, because so am I, okay? Two parties with the same information in front of them that are both all reasonable never fail. And that's what we have right now. Let me take let me take this and run with it. And I'll get you a set of plans. I'll talk to one or two architects, registered architects, okay? And I'll get back to you and you can give me your feedback. It's gonna go to you before anybody else. That sounds good. And I do think Brian can tell you who some of the architects are who you know work in town. There certainly are people all the we see them all the time. You'll probably see that we will recommend favorable action on their work. So it's um it's once you get the architect, the the architect is going to be looking at what's next door and looking at light and uh, the, what you see outside your window and so on. So as I said, I'm, yeah, I I actually know one of them. He just doesn't know that I know. Hey, he's an architect. Aha, sneaky. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so then um, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a she. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I think if 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 the board is is open to that flexibility and not per, not doing a perfect duplicate of this structure, but simply saying that we 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 prefer to have a duplex, you know, oh, how do we want to phrase that? Which fits in with the historical structure and the rest of the neighborhood. I mean, I'd like to yeah. see it one yeah. over one. In Do that. And I'll stop the way, you there. Do that. Do that's a good one. It's a follow up. Um, although I was <laughs> devastated, some of you know this, to lose a Greek revival house on Cross Street. Um, Heather Von Meering did give some ideas too about what it would look like. And I have to say, Heather, if, I'm sorry we lost the house, but what you're just as you sketch some things, it really got it going in the right direction. And it really does fit in very well with Cross Street. New construction can be. Um, contextual and that new one on cross street i thought worked out quite well so i'll let heather make any comments on that um i i actually was fine it's just say mirroring it and uh replicating it because then we know for sure the scale matches the height matches the architecture style matches uh and it's complementary um so i can i can envision it but i and i i think it would be excellent but I, if you want to leave more opportunity for flexibility, that's fine too. I'm just, I'm really concerned more about in the long haul um, is just the materials and those, you know, the handrails and the, that the staircase is at the left side. One of the drawings, it shows it off to the center. One shows it off to the left um, for the historical house. But otherwise I'm, I think it's, I, I'm just, let's go, let's go. Okay, well, <laughs> let's say that reflects the existing house or it complements yep. with an E, not an I, complements the existing house or is um, uh, consistent with the massing and scale of the existing house, something like that. Yeah, mm. the square footage and the two units. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. so does anyone have any idea what this motion actually is? Brian does. Well, no one second it. Do you want to pull it and redo it? I, no, can I, Brian, we can... put up your note so we can just write it so it can be written real quick? Um, sure. Or uh, we could also, it's possible that Nancy has already written it down if we want to get Nancy there. That would be great. Nancy, um, for those who are listening, Nancy is our recording secretary. Yep, uh, I'll, do my, I'll do my best here. Um, okay, so Dia moved uh, the planning board recommend 88 Harvard um, restore the existing uh, duplex and in consistence with the square footage of the existing house and style or uh, historic Ayo. character. Character of the historic house, yeah. Um, Nancy, could you add scale? Scale, yep. Thank you. All right, so let me back up a little bit. Um, so restore the... Uh, historic existing house and in consistence with the square footage scale and character of the existing house 
uh, on um, build build a duplex. Build on the right side, a, a duplex. Yep, uh, on the right lot, and the lot line be moved. So okay. that the lots are of equal size. The lots are equal size. Okay. So moved. Thank you, Nancy. You're Thank welcome. You. <laughs> okay. okay. So moved. Um, discussion. Roll call vote, please, Planning Board. We go in alphabetical uh, order. Jarius, aye. Meister, I think I'm next. Aye. Wolf, aye. Von Mearing, aye. Motion passes 4 0 with Hannon absent. Thank you, Sean and Brendan, for joining us. Okay, I, I'll, get the I'll get back to you and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. You can look at it and you can give me feedback and we'll go back and forth until we get it right. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Um, we have about 15 minutes uh, planning board for updates. There's a bunch of things that are going on at the state level and also local. So, Brian, do you want to kick it off with Washington Swanton Street RFP? Sure. Um, there's a number of people that are on the call right now, uh, Cheryl Wolf and Dennis Carlone, that are also part of that group. So I'm glad that the three of us are here. Um, the consultant uh, is taking comments from um, the working group, which consists of three residents, a planning board member, Cheryl Wolf, uh, Dennis Carlone, the design consultant, myself. Uh, and then um, other town staff uh, and also a member of the select board. Um, so the, moving towards a potential uh, release of an RFP towards the end of January, but after the conversations we had this week, it's possible that um, it could end up being moved a little bit further. Um, the RFP will then be, uh, there will be uh, it's an issue in terms of how we're going to receive a, a lot and depends upon how much of the public feedback. So as of right now, the RFP has not been released um, to pretty, pretty much anybody outside of the working group. And um, however, there are three residents that are, are supposed to be at this moment, as in Monday, Tuesday, and tomorrow, Wednesday, are supposed to be going out into the community uh, that they are representing. So that's this first initial phase of how we're gonna get some feedback on the RFP, but we anticipate that most of the um, public feedback we will get will be later in the process in terms of once we receive, um, once we actually receive responses. So I don't know if Cheryl or Dennis is on the call wanted to expand on that, but that's, um, that's pretty much it on, yeah, I have on my end for that. I'd love to hear about the design ideas, but I know a short version, but I'd love that. Um, so at the, at the moment, um, uh, yeah, Dennis, why don't you go right ahead? He, he wrote some design guidelines. Uh, we're deciding not to do too many visuals at all for this RFP and have it in guidelines. So Dennis, why don't you take it away? Uh, and then Cheryl after. Thank you, Brian. Um, hello, everyone. <clears throat> what we basically did was modify the downtown uh, guideline standards, uh, but to make it more of a neighborhood uh, context. And we were pretty specific um, on having a design that fronts on the street, on both streets, and uh, presents a highly residential image, including uh, strong roof articulation, residential roof articulation. In my own mind, um, I could see duplexes on the third floor going up into the roof for bedrooms up above, but that's up to the developer. Uh, I recommended 10% of the site be used as a uh, um, a courtyard setting for the people in the building. Uh, we recommended ground floor, some ground floor retail. That's going to be tough to pull off, but one could see at least one retail um, on Washington Street near the corner. We talked about having buffers along existing houses where there is a common property line. Um, 
similar to downtown, we talked about the scale of windows, the materials. What I wrote, and uh, people will critique it, is the first floor, you probably know the site slants nine feet from the corner to where the pointer is now. Um, so I said that the first floor in any lower level that's exposed should be brick. And above that, a more residential wood-like uh, architecture. Um, I also said that given the site slants nine feet uh, down Swanton, that there, you, the that uh, direction, the developer will automatically be building a basement uh, almost the full depth, all that whole length from where the pointer is all the way to the end. So there easily could be parking under that wing of the building. Uh, we proposed a five foot setback on both sides on the streets. Um, so the sidewalks are wider. And if there is a restaurant or a communal activity on the ground floor, um, there could be outdoor seating or outdoor dining. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that would be worth mentioning. We talked about screening the parking, which obviously would be behind this L-shaped building. Um, we talked about within 50 feet of where the pointer is, there's a house behind all those trees. Um, within 50 feet of a lower density residential, the building might be one story less tall. Um, so it's more similar in height to the house next to it. Uh, let's see. Dennis? Yes, please. So we're going to design, do an urban plan on this site. Out of curiosity, what height in this site would you say this can take in stories? It's probably zoning wise 45 feet, but the top floor has to be gables and slanted roofs. So you're talking three feet and three stories? Uh, 45 feet, you, if the top floor is bedrooms, for the units below, you could get three and a half stories in or four stories, the fourth behind a slope roof. Okay, and then um, you're talking then also in the RFP about reducing that height as you approach down um, Washington. Within 50, yes, within 50 feet of the mutual property line. So it probably would be something like 35 feet of building and 15 foot buffer. And is there something in there about screening the roof mechanics and stuff from that house as oh, yes. well? Without looking at, okay. Yes, definitely. And okay, thank you. you you're welcome. All sounds um, great. Thank you, Dennis, for your time. Well, on we, did, that. we decided not to do drawings because just the time limit. Um, and uh, Cheryl mentioned that the guidelines are pretty explicit, so. They are pretty explicit. I, I mean, I can imagine what this would look like. The guidelines from the center business district, you're saying, right? The refined ones, we revise them for this site and this scale and the conditions here. So they are for this site. They're for 40B projects. And then we specified number of issues for this site. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Brian, does the town own this land yet? Do you have an update on that? No, that is ongoing. Uh, no update. So we don't have ownership yet, but we're going for an RFP for it. Correct. Okay. Um, Cheryl, did you have anything to add to on your observations? Yeah, I felt that the, um, the group only um, met once. So we've only reviewed um, the consultant's first draft of the RFP. Um, I thought um, what Dennis um, put forward was um, very clear. Um, as he said, we sort of agreed that if we provide design um, 
what ends up happening is um, the uh, visuals that come back tend to mimic what we've put on paper. So um, it's more important that we have rules and um, guidelines that are very clear and prioritized. So I think one thing that was the, the strongest um, or the, the, the takeaway for everyone at the end was that we prioritize um, the, uh, the rules. I, I'm sorry, Dennis, I'm not thinking of the right word, but. Um, Guidelines, standards. Yeah, the standards by which each of the applicants would be judged. So um, if we prioritize those based on what the town and um, everyone in the neighborhood and um, all of us would would like to see, um, you know, then we will we will get um, we will get proposals that lean towards what what we're looking for, and then um, we can follow up on on the lesser priorities as we go. But essentially, it's making sure that we get a housing project that has affordable and mixed income, um, preferably rental. Um, with a commercial first floor, because we do want this to be, you know, a part of uh, a piece of the downtown coming out to this location as it was before. Um, and then, of course, all of the, the design challenges associated with zoning and regulations, sustainability and traffic and parking. And then, of course, um, the experience of working with a developer. Um, and so, you know, we're all um, giving our feedback on those priorities so that uh, the developer, the developers actually put things forward that we can, we can um, put them next to each other and really evaluate um, who's going to do, who's going to be the most successful with the priorities we have in mind. I Brian, hope, can you? Uh, oh. if I could add, I hope uh, we review the designs and critique them for, I guess it's the select people, select men, um, because I have found in other similar competitions that in many cases, the wrong one gets picked. From based, a on, based on criteria? Yeah, yeah. yes. It usually is financial and almost every one I've been a part of. So uh, I'm just throwing that out to the board. Well, unfortunately, we throw that out in your meetings because we don't have much say in what we get a review and what we don't, we can ask. Um, yeah, that led to my uh, next question is, Brian, the three residents that are supposed to be doing the outreach to um, the community, can you provide those three names to us? So um, members who are here who, if they want to um, have conversations Conversations. It's. I, I think the planning board. I. I know. I have uh, expressed that the process. I don't like it very much because I feel that the outreach outside of this little group is very confined. Um, uh, I get that. Um, it sounds like when um, the select board, um, Mike Bettencourt, met with the planning board in our last meeting, um, just because he was on it, um, had mentioned that he was trying to get to a time schedule. I don't quite understand the time schedule, but um, at least can we get the names of the three residents, Brian? So residents who are listening, who if they want more feedback or to contribute, I can reach out to those three residents for if that's what they're supposed to be doing. Sure. Uh, Krista Russo, R-U-S-S-O. Stephanie Zaremba, Z-A-R-E-M-B-A. Um, and then Randall Drain. Randall Drain, these are all either abutters or near abutters to the property. Um, and uh, Randall Drain specifically, he, he did not consider him a spokesman for, for the neighborhood, but, but um, does correspond with the neighborhood of about um, an email group that's 75 people that was involved with the CVS um, litigation. Um, so, but to be fair, that, 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 that's it. So it's those three people and their outreach and one of them happens to uh, run a 75 person, um, basically, like I said, that CVS litigation group. And Brian, are you taking the leadership role on this or are you just kind of, uh, 
where where is your position in the group are you as of right yeah as of right now i'm uh reviewing the rfp just like everybody else on the on the group on the group and then doing very small amounts of admin role related to meetings um but minimal there so i'm i i see myself at the moment as as just another value member of the group okay thank you I'm going to move on planning board so we can get because we have a couple other things and we still have our hearing and I really want to get to some of the stuff that's going on at the state level so everyone can hear about it. Um, what's the Waterfield LDA update, Brian? So the Waterfield, um, so the MOU, which would have a memorandum of understanding happened before or right around, like right around town meeting that led up to the LDA, which is the land disposal agreement. Uh, that's um, so that is still in process at the moment, but they are shooting towards a deal with Civico and their partners to have a, a to set the lease up um, ready for spring town meeting. So that is the timeline that they that they are on, and they seem to be going towards that that timeline. Um, they are negotiating the lease terms. Um, I know. Um, that it was going to be a 99 year lease term. And I think it's still going to be a 99 year lease term, but there's going to be a potential somewhere in the 20 to 30 year mark that there will be a potential for a renegotiation of the deal. Um, another thing that's really important to uh, the lease is the fact that one of the main reasons that Civico was chosen was because of the way that their numbers worked out with underground parking and parking in general, as well as many other things, but that was the one thing that made them unique was the underground parking. So the uh, everyone want, wanted to make sure that that could actually work. So that's being incorporated into it as well. I'm not exactly, so I have not seen a copy of that. Uh, they're still, it's, it's, it's mostly lawyers at the moment with uh, the manager taking the lead on that. So that's the update there. Um, alongside that, I'll add also to the planning board, the uh, train station was shut down this week uh, for safety reasons. Um, luckily, um, it also <laughs> brought opportunity for our delegates along with our town leadership to go back to the NBTA and ask them to reconsider funding the reconstruction of our station. And um, yesterday they came through and said that they will be funding and returning funds to um, reconstruct, restore, rehabilitate, many different words have been used, this town center train station. Um, so um, Lisa Wong had a conversation today to find out that timeline. Most likely um, she'll be sending out an update um, in her weekly updates that she does, a, or it's like a bulletin um, on Friday of what the schedule they're tentatively looking at. But most likely um, from what I can understand, they're going to go into bid and um, most likely start the summer, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, but she will give more information uh, later this week on that. Um, going to the Massachusetts bill. Um, we don't have enough time. I'll stop right there, Heather. We don't have enough time to go through the whole entire economic oh, yeah. development bill, yeah. but this bill is a huge, huge bill that's imminent, that's going to be imminently signed by governor by the governor. Um, it's a $626 million bill that ranges uh, from, a, uh, there's a lot of COVID related uh, items as well as a lot of economic stimulus uh, but what most pertinent to us uh, is that, uh, and this is a pretty big deal actually uh, in Massachusetts, is that now the legislature in our in our case town meeting can uh, approve zoning uh, uh, bylaws through a simple majority instead of the traditional and long-standing two-thirds majority. This is a very large game changer. This was done mainly. Um, or well, there is a number of reasons, but one of the biggest was uh, was that Governor Baker wanted to do this in order to promote the hundreds of thousands of units that he feels the Commonwealth needs over the next 25 years. And there's a resistance to density in many uh, many communities. So this uh, this is how it's it's being addressed. And then the side with that too, Brian, is inside that bill. And correct me if I'm wrong, is my understanding inside that bill, there is a uh, item in there that all within a half mile radius of all train stations by right can go to multifamily. 
um, which in the center business district isn't such a concern, uh, except it removes site plan and special permit caveats, uh, but it is a concern for Wedgemere currently where everything around it is single family. And so this Brian um, and town council is looking into it um, and uh, we'll have more information on that as we can, um, but it's a big question, huge question mark actually of how that impacts us, how that impacts our historical districts. We don't have local historic districts right now. Um, if they were local historic districts are downtown, um, would that um, make it we, you know, so going from there, we need more information, but it's something that the planning board is well aware of and is looking into it and in as much depth as we can right now to figure out exactly how that impacts the half mile radius around both of our train stations. Well, I, I just because I've read about it in this morning's globe and then I went and looked at Mass Municipal Association's website and the letter that was sent by Jeff Beckworth. And it's something that municipalities are cranking up about. Um, this would take away the special permit process. And that means even in the CBD, no special permit, that's a whole different world. Um, but there, it would be taking away, removing the special permit, but within a certain zone, um, boundaries. And I don't, the part I can't see is just exactly how those boundaries would get set. It has to be done within the radius of the half mile of the um, transit, but it doesn't say, how those boundaries get established. It's not everything, it's not the entire radius, it's the bound, uh, some boundary and some supposedly reasonable area has to be uh, created um, and designated for this development. So it's, but it, we don't have anything like that. No community does, because this is no, it would be by right, no special permit. Um, yeah. I wanna talk very super brief, because there's some things that were said that I that I think should just, just deserve clarification. And then I think we need to open up the hearing. But the one thing I wanted to say, uh, this is saying that the use of multifamily does not require a special permit. So I want to make that very clear that it's not saying that now you don't need a special permit to do anything. Right now, it, we have mixed use and residential and residential on upper floors. Those are allowed by right. In the center business district. In the center However, business district. Wedgemere to be, is different. Yeah. Wedgemere is different. I just wanted to make clear, it's not like we're getting rid of any special permit processes. We are, we're currently already have by right housing in the center business district that's multifamily. So that's not an issue. However, it could be a potentially very large issue for Wedgman. So I wanna make that very clear. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't stress that enough, so no. sorry. It's a, a high priority and something that we'll be looking into and we will be tracking it because if we need to change our zoning for, uh, for um, springtime meeting, we will do that as quickly as we can to support um, what we need to do and to do it the best we can with the information we have um, to bring it to town meeting for the consideration. So I would like to move on. We can come back to updates uh, to the members of the planning board um, at a later time if we have, but I would like to go on because we're supposed to have a hearing eight minutes ago and we're doing pretty well with our schedule going through everything. And so I'd like to go to that hearing. Um, let me get my papers out real quick and uh, we'll begin one moment. All right, so I am going to officially welcome the public to the hearing. It's a continuation of the hearing on 654 Main Street in Winchester of the Winchester Planning Board. For all those who are here um, that are participating, um, you have officially signed in when you signed into Zoom. So typically when you would be meet with us in person, um, those days were great. Uh, we would have you sign a piece of paper with your name. However, because of Zoom, uh, you have signed in when you signed in to join our meeting. Um, welcome everyone. I'd like to remind everyone, as I always do at the beginning of our meeting, but also uh, at the time of our hearings, that this is being recorded for the benefit of those who have just come for the hearing. It will be available on WinCam. Uh, it's actually probably live broadcasted right now, although I've not checked. And also it will be also recorded and put up online at WinCam's website. Um, so you are being recorded. Um, as I said, the purpose of the public hearing is to co the continue the review of a special permit application for 654 Main Street. Um, today, uh, I don't know if I really need to go through the rules uh, for the public. We are going to get an update from Dennis Carlone uh, regarding the status of everything. A, we have a very large meeting um, anticipated on this project. 
um, in, at our next meeting um, with uh, some changes coming forward um, from the applicant and their drawings. But between now and then, uh, our consultant has been working with the applicant and is here to give us an update. Um, based on time, um, I also wanted to also note and put the more, we received more memos and letters received by the board um, from um, different members of the community. Uh, Brian, do you, do you wanna quickly summarize those so we can put those in the record um, and stay on top of those um, after Dennis speaks? That would be great um, before we um, continue the hearing. So at this point, we're really listening. We're going to be meeting with the consultant to hear the updates. Um, there are certain information they need from us and uh, away we go. So um, Dennis, if you would like to state your name and company and your address for the record and then provide us your update. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, Brian, do you want to give an overview first? Um, yeah, I'll talk for about 30 seconds. Um, so we, uh, and when I say we, I mean uh, myself and uh, Dennis Carlone and the architecture team at um, Salukian, um, along with Ian Gillespie and his partners, um, Jan Sternberg and Paul Sutley, um, we met once before the, the new year and once after the new year, um, taking into consideration the comments that everybody heard at the last meeting. Um, the idea is that there will be a full set um, of, uh, of new, uh, well, uh, a, full set, uh, a full set of drawings uh, uh, leading up to the 26th. Um, and then Dennis is going to go through right now a few things, uh, the, the items that have changed, and then he'll turn it over to Ted. So thank you, Brian. Uh, so I'm Dennis Carlone. Uh, my practice is Carlone and Associates. We're architects and urban designers. I've been working on the downtown with the planning board since 2012. Um, and the pl basic plan zoning and design review guidelines standards um, I strongly participated in. As Brian uh, outlined, we've really been looking at the site for quite a long time. It's over a year, I think, or close to that. And um, I'm happy to say that uh, just about all the issues that the planning board raised, if not all the issues and ones that I've raised have been resolved in a very handsome way um, the massing is generally the same. In fact, it is the same, but there are subtle differences um, that have been redesigned. Um, I, I think some is extremely creative, and I'll, I'll point out how uh, the trees in the courtyard are handled. And uh, um, there is a change in scale from the front building, the mercantile, so-called mercantile wing, compared to the um, side street, Elmwood Avenue uh, building. Uh, it's broken. They're, they're different, but they're completely related and overlap in a very handsome way. There's a priority given to the retail floor um, to, to make the retail as strong as possible. And this building pretty much will end the retail on that side of Main Street uh, that connects back to the downtown center. Uh, we looked at many issues, the list that the planning board had. I won't go over all of it because Ted will, and, and as he goes through the update momentarily, there obviously, since this is really, um, it's beyond schematic, it's beginning to get into design development, but this is at the early phase. This building is more refined than just about any building I've ever worked with within a special permit overview. Um, 
So there are some outstanding things that are normal in this kind of review. The design review will continue through design development, through construction documents, and even on site. They each of the time commitments on my part will get a lot less. So obviously the color of materials are not pinned down. We talked about them. We can talk about them tonight. Their the goal is to fit into the downtown. Um, the uh, lighting, the, uh, the detail development of all the details will come um, and other issues will develop as we come along. But I have to say in all honesty that every issue we brought up actually for all the meetings we've had and we might have as many as six meetings, seven design meetings, um, beginning last year through this year, that there's been a handsome resolution. It is a distinctive building um, that attempts to do difficult things. And the board, some members of the board might remember, I was very worried in general in the floodplain about how retail would be handled. How do you incorporate a ramp in a handsome way and make something more of it than just a ramp. Um, and that has been done in this building. I think, and I mentioned this to everybody that was on the call yesterday, that the Elmwood Avenue views that you're going to see have a nice, I use the term English, but European feel to them. Um, including the existing building in the foreground, as you'll see in the rendering. Um, the building on Main Street opens up to the downtown on the first floor, and we've integrated potential improvements to Elmwood Avenue that we will talk to the town engineer in the future and getting information from your consultant's tool. Uh, but we're showing what we think makes sense. Um, some of the real strong comments by the planning board as far as the roofscape, uh, top floor treatment of the brick building near the historic house, you will see has been changed and follows the lead of the planning board. Uh, we got into some more details about fencing, um, about screening, and I think uh, I'm happy to talk about anything else, and I'm going to make note of anything the planning board says tonight, but I will prepare a written document based on the design that comes in, um, which would be pretty much like tonight, but in the next week or so plus listing out all the things that will come, a test wall, uh, the types of color of materials in the test wall. Uh, we'll know more about lighting. We'll know more about graphics. Uh, we'll know more about mechanical, although the goal is and will stay that mechanical is primarily out of view. Um, the transformer, will be within the building. We did discuss that. So all those issues that can be problematic down the line have been resolved to a great degree, more than any other project that I can think of that uh, even in my work at other uh, locations. So I thought that we would have Ted give an overview um, we specifically selected uh, views that show all the issues that I believe the planning board brought up. Um, and Ted, you can begin that at any time. I should also say one last thing. These meetings have become very cooperative um, and the whole development team has been supportive of making a building that's good for Winchester and obviously good for future tenants. Ted, why don't you uh, 
begin it. And if I see something else in your drawings, Ted, and you don't call it out, I might call it out. So excuse me in advance. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I'm going to just chime in real quick, just so everyone who's listening knows when you were saying that you were having a meeting that was not with anyone from the planning board, that yeah. was with staff along with the application team and the consultant. Yes, so, thank you. Uh, thank members you. of the planning board were not present at that meeting. This is the first time we're getting an update, just like everyone else. I just thank want you. to clarify that. Thank you part. very much, Chair. I should have said that. I, I know the rules, and that is absolutely true. Thank you for saying that. Yep, no problem. All right, uh, Mr. Talukian, who is the architect uh, of record for the project, um, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is Ted Talukian, and I just want to just start by saying, can you see a blue screen that says 12 January? At yes, we can. Okay, excellent. I'm going to try to, okay. All right, well, great. Just to reflect on what Dennis had mentioned, I do want to thank Dennis and our design team. I do agree we had a lot of very positive and cooperative, and I would even add the word enjoyable discussions. And I think really strong minded in the sense of wanting to do something particularly special for Winchester and to really fit into the fabric. And um, I think it's just been a great uh, team discussion. I do understand that our role tonight is really to provide a um, highlight of the changes that were recommended, not just only in the last um, planning board uh, meeting that we had, but also through conversations with uh, uh, Mr. Carlone. And uh, what we've tried to do here is recap uh, those changes that were circulated. And um, tonight, I'm really not going to provide a full design review, as Dennis had mentioned, but really just to sort of highlight the changes. And then at the end, of course, if people have additional questions, we'll do our best to answer those. In general, I would mention that the areas, which are 1 through 16 here, are the biggest areas that we understood was uh, the corn number 2, the corner transition between main and vine, as well as number 3, the cornice. And uh, number five, um, the windows along Main Street, as well as the pedestrian experience with the street trees and pavers and the sidewalk uh, along Elmwood. And in general, I think uh, our, our changes have been really in a way to um, look at how we can uh, reinforce the t uh, details, uh, enhance materials, and particularly evaluate transitions between the residential neighborhood and the commercial Main Street District, as well as really um, promote um, an improved pedestrian experience that not only occurs with you know, great visibility with the retail level access, of course, but also uh, details around signage and canopies and lighting. Um, so over and all, um, I won't sort of run through these details in its entirety here, but try to touch on them as we go, and like Dennis said, please, you know, of course, um, add information. Just quick thing that I also want to point out on the uh, slide here, which was on the redevelopment slide, which is the data. It's unchanged from our last project, but due to some comments that were brought up around affordable housing, we did update this slide to include 10% of dwelling units shall be affordable to low income applicants at 80% AMI, as well as 5% affordable to middle income between 80 and 20%, 120% AMI. And of course, this is subject to approval by the Housing Partnership Board, and we will continue to work with that board to uh, locate those units as needed. Um, additionally, uh, throughout our conversations, again, uh, just looking, we really did think carefully as the best we could around the design principles, elements of form, and the details, which have been at the forefront of our mind throughout the discussion. Just for record here of discussion, we have our site plan, uh, existing site plan. And I think these details have been able to tell a story of our progression really over the last maybe eight to 10, 12 months about how the massing developed. And I think we're really focusing on transitions with the roof line silhouettes and the, uh, the let's say, uh, Elmwood and Vine neighborhood buildings, as well as the connections between the cornices that exist along uh, Main Street. Um, the site planning is very consistent. And one of the biggest things that we did was we evaluated the street tree progression and really looked at turning those street trees slightly up Elmwood. And with, uh, with based on, I want to say, further review with the town, want to look at ways that we can side widen the sidewalk slightly in order to sort of help focus traffic 
along Elmwood and really reinforce that pedestrian experience around the corner because the building has such a strong corner impact. Uh, these are back again to the aerials, and I think the big, we'll get to this at some of the um, perspectives themselves, we begin to, begin to see uh, the brick sidewalk extension, the turn has, as Dennis had initially pointed, as well as the street trees that help again reinforce that corner and create um, a stronger pedestrian experience. Looking in the opposite direction, our other main area that we looked at, as you recall, um, the building on Main Street had turned the corner and imposed itself a little bit into uh, Vine Street and the residential fabric and through a lot of discussion about how can we really work to improve the transition, we've taken the residential uh, dormers and gable roofs and brought them around to really, I think, create a really effective backdrop to 63 Vine Street and really soften the edges, which we'll show you in more of the perspective views. Additionally, at the ground level, we have put, uh, made sure retail B was one foot above of the 100 year floodplain and looked at some of the um, access points that get in, minor tweaking, but feel that they're working well. And wanted to point out that Beals, the civil engineer, will be working uh, on the review that DHB has provided the third party. And this we recognize is not a part or a focus of this conversation today. And uh, so, again, similar to our last uh, presentations, I'm going to try to provide really a virtual walk around the block, starting on Elmwood. And I'm just going to try to point out some key details. Could in... you go back, Ted? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, please, Dennis. Just go back one slide, if you please can. Sure. One more? Just back to the water storage. No, back, backwards. There may be a delay, so yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Um, please notice, and the, whoops. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Stay there. Um, the section in the lower right-hand corner, you will notice that there's the basement where the parking is, label B, and then there's first floor where the retail is and the courtyard is, but what you see there where Ted is pointing out, that is soil on a slab. And in between that soil and the parking below is where the water flood storage will be stored. Um, I've never seen this before, this effort to make sure that the trees in the courtyard have sufficient soil, real soil and are in the ground, so to say. Um, and I uh, give the development team a lot of credit for doing this. One of the details that will develop will be how, what it looks like where the water comes in, where you see the red arrows above that. But that's way down the line and we'll get to that later on. Thank you, Ted. Oh, thank you, Dennis. Um, so I'm just gonna try to highlight and I understand we have limited time, so I may go quickly some of the, the areas of uh, concern and how we address them. Uh, this view from Elmwood really begins to see uh, the detail progression of, let's say, the cornice. And what we've done is added a sheet metal sort of very small projection, as well as some uh, soldier coursing and stepped brick at the top to make, I think, a stronger cap to the building. Additionally, uh, we've looked at some soldier coursing at some of the heads of some of the windows. Uh, but in general, I think that the relationship of the gables and dormers and the way the mercantile building and the, let's say, residential building work together has been a big focus of how um, they communicate. Uh, I think another piece that Dennis pointed up earlier is that I think the detail materiality, the color of the brick is going to be terribly important at the, with the end result. And because these are SketchUp models, it's very difficult to really understand the, uh, the materiality of the tactile and the color and the reflection and the way light um, works with this. But I think through the use of mock-ups in the future, we'll really be able to ascertain um, that color, which uh, really will be, we believe, in line with the authentic New England red brick that is sympathetic to the Winchester uh, you know, community and some of the details along that as well. Uh, 
Additionally, the mechanical, we have recessed that as you pointed out, and it's a big part of our detail and the section information. Another area that we did look at was the ground plane. And uh, this had a much larger, um, wider amount of wood for the garage doors. And we really looked at how to bring masonry piers to make them more, I think, scaled in terms of being punched in their openings. Um, and as you move back here along Main Street, you begin to see how we turn the corner with the sidewalk and the brick pavers and the street trees and the canopies and the planters to help really humanize that ground floor level. And I understand that this is something that we'll continue to um, propose and work with the town on, uh, and particularly with tools, uh, the traffic uh, third party review. And I don't know if Ed Dennis, you wanna add anything around this area, because I think this has really been a great improvement in terms of how the corner, I'm probably going quickly here, is reinforced. Uh, maybe just before that, I do wanna point out um, there were much thinner, I think metal, sheet metal returns. We've gone to a wider granite surround at the masonry piers to help scale the openings and make transitions, as well as added soldier coursing along the tops. And as I pointed out earlier, some additional soldier coursing. And we worked, we looked at a number of different window uh, details. And I think the rhythms have been improved in terms of centering the windows making even transitions and uh, reinforcing the depth of those windows to be about eight to 10 inches back from the masonry, which really creates, I think, a lot of depth and shadow along the facade that takes away from the panelized sort of flat aesthetic that sometimes occurs with uh, um, contemporary masonry buildings. And so I think it's much more uh, sympathetic to um, the scale of uh, a masonry building that is uh, sensitive to these areas. We also straightened out, uh, I would say, stacked the balconies as opposed to stacking them. And um, I think those are probably some of the points. Dennis, did you want to add anything about the, the ground level at this corner? Yes. So this corner with the ramp, um, I, I'd have to be honest. I, 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 you're going to laugh, and that's OK. I actually wanted to raise the street. Um, to the height that we were allowed and then slope back with ponds to compensate. But this is an elegant way of doing it and making it more than just a ramp. Um, and you can see the outdoor seating there. Um, and by extending the corner, Elmwood, as you know, is one way coming toward us. It makes this corner special and becomes an ideal place for a crossing across Main Street. And it, it basically says the ramp location and this corner says this is the end of the retail with the hardware store being the main attraction. I have recommended, and we've not talked to the town engineer yet or tool, that the crosswalk on Elmwood might be a raised crosswalk on Elmwood so that you don't even have the uh, the sloping sidewalk. And it basically signals a smaller scale street. But you can see the potential here. Um, the street is not wide. Um, and what we're trying to do is recognize that it needs to be a nicer corner. Um, right now, where there's parking on that, where the two trees are, there's parking, but that's on the site that is private land. So any sidewalk has to come into the street on Elmwood, even further up Ted's drawing, that is town land, not private land. So it's, it's a, I think a good solution all around. Thank you, Dennis. And um, again, you know, looking down uh, Main Street, um, we did add an additional tree and by adding the other trees on Elmwood really helps provide, I think, further meaning to the corner and the way people are drawn into the uh, retail and uh, reinforces that pedestrian experience. And you begin to see it more at this scale here. Um, I, I'm particularly pleased too with um, the rhythms and how we're beginning to sort of develop the edge treatments and the canopies. We have also looked at um, 
the lower level here by adding stem lighting <clears throat> that is stemmed off of the masonry uh, for the signage. Those little extra accoutrements, those details, they're like kind of like jewelry on a building. They really help um, provide a, a sense of balance and scale. And you begin to see how the details of um, the soldier coursing uh, uh, at each window location along the bay helps unify the pieces together. And I also want to mention that soldier coursing finds itself up in the cornice. And so trying to create some commonality in the details and the expression. And again, at this uh, pedestrian scale. We also added some textures uh, to the bottom of the fixed panel, uh, changed slightly the color of those materials. And uh, as well, looking down the street pulling back and then turning the corner. And this is now where you begin to see uh, the transitions that are occurring, where we worked on uh, altering the roof line to remove that sort of flatter mercantile building and immediately begin to transition to the dormers that begin to respond to the pedestrian scale as you move up towards Vine Street. And you begin to see the dormers and the rhythms and I think it will make a big difference in terms of the way light um, reflects and that proportion, I think, makes a significant difference in terms of how you experience the transition in the residential neighborhood. As well, uh, looked at cedar fencing or painted uh, fencing with lattice work along the top. And I think it was brought up around some handrail details that we brought in here. I do want to point out that a guardrail is not required due to the edge condition, but we thought for additional safety, we could provide a nice handrail um, just to reinforce the edge. Um, and as you move back uh, into uh, Vine Street. Also, another comment was around um, the elevator. Uh, and we took it as an opportunity to provide further texturing uh, of, of brick and masonry to create better light and shadow connections between the, let's say, the, the stippled brick in this zone here and this uh, overrun, as well as providing um, uh, frosted glass, uh, which is indicative of, I, I would say the frosted glass, but sort of openings, which are more indicative of some of the silhouettes that are a part of um, the neighborhood. And so overall, I think that's kind of a very high level summary. Uh, the zoning information is really unchanged. And uh, I think uh, the purpose around um, the center bis business district uh, regulations, I think is something that stayed at the forefront of our mind in terms of how we really look to further humanize some of the details. So with that, I'll turn it over and I wanna say thank you to everyone involved. Thank you, Ted, for all your work on that. And thank you also, Dennis. Members of the board, um, this will be coming back to us with a much bigger presentation in our next, next meeting, uh, is my understanding, is that correct? Okay, so um, really what they're looking for is before they come in with the big presentation, if they are on the right track, if you see anything where you're like, oh, you missed this, or um, so they're just really looking for a kind of a quick overview um, from us to make sure that they're on the right track before we get, um, they go back to the tra tables and provide us something the Friday before our next meeting. So members of the board. Um, it's Maureen. Um, I, overall, I, I'm really, especially like the pedestrian experience. It's very strong. Um, I think I, thanks to both Dennis and Ted. Um, and the, I have to laugh. I'm, I'm speaking to you from a house, a brick house that has a lot of soldier courses. So uh, I do love the texture that created there. Um, the recessing of the windows, that uh, is terrific. So lots and lots of things that I think are um, really positive. Um, I have mentioned it before and I just didn't, I guess it didn't get picked up. It's relatively minor. I'm sure something can be developed, but I guess I'll flip it over and do not expect a response right now. But I've, um, every time I've looked at these I've, uh, elevations, renderings, I've um, just been uh, caught by the shed dormers and there's uh, whether it's the way they drop directly from the ridge, if they even came down in a couple, like four inches, um, and then the vertical, I'm sorry, the horizontal at the top of the window. Also, maybe it, there would be more design work later, but right now it just looks like these horizontal boards 
and they look like I see them as like eyes where the lids are low and I'd like them to open their eyes. So can I you, guess I'd like Lauren, some, can you explain what elevation you're looking at? Well, my, it, it doesn't much matter, but right now I'm looking at the one that's up Elmwood, but it doesn't really matter any, it's the shed dormers throughout the entire, um, what's it called? Not the mercantile, but the residential compon- uh, portion. It just, anyway, the shed dormers consistently are coming from the ridge and top of the ridge line. And they're also having these very strong horizontals where most shed dormers, I mean, anywhere, uh, don't have that big horizontal, I don't know if it's wood or whatever, that horizontal element. But as I said, the eyes look like they're drooping rather than opening up and looking bright. So I guess I think something, or maybe some mold, I don't know what, but anyway, right now there are different ways that they, and I think they could use some work. Um, maybe the reason is also because they do drop, um, they do drop vertically right through the um, the eaves. Uh, the, there's this, they do have this kind of sheer look instead of having some um, a, sh- a little bit set back. So anyway, those are my thoughts. But the dormers, I'd love to see. It, you and Dennis should talk about what else might be done. We, um, uh, I don't I think we have to discuss it now, frankly. But we, we have discussed it, and both Ted and I, and Brian and the de- development team, know that's one of the areas that will be further detailed. Okay, uh, thank you. We That's recognize fine. that, we and but we concentrated on issues that, uh, frankly, might be a little more difficult. And, oh, there, not the, we, enough of this. Uh, good, um, and I'm glad to hear that. Uh, there's a lot that you've done. It's terrific. I think we're. Uh, by the way, while I'm looking up Elmwood, what is the dark thing in the little against the retaining wall? Oh, this right here, where my mouse is. I keep looking at it. It's like, what is that? Oh. Oh, that is a stepped wall, and and that was just some planters that were in that location. And you know, I I think that's that's really what it is. It's just a sketch of probably shadow issue. Um, it's there. Um, isn't it? No, go further back. It's against the new building that um, is now where the condos are being sold. Looks like a buttress to me. Yeah, I, I, I'm just, I, it looks like a giant worm to me. But anyway, whatever. I just am perplexed. But it's an existing wall. There yeah. is an existing wall there. Yeah, um, that's a stepped uh, wall that's there. And those are planters on top of the step wall. Cast. Oh, okay. And just one last thing, Maureen. I do want to mention that this, I have not been able to focus on that with um, you know, the details. And I think we'll look at the, the header, but it is all sheet metal. And uh, we'll continue to look at that. We'll look at it more closely. Okay. Yeah. Metal, sheet metals can be expensive. I don't know. I, it could even be molding. But anyway, I'm not, I don't think we should discuss it right now. Um, other members of the planning board? Uh, this is Deb. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I, this is, I'm really thrilled with what you've done. I think it's really, uh, it's really improved. Um, I don't have a, a lot more things to say. I have one minor thing in that I hope that when you plant the trees, you don't have the weeds at the base of them like you see in these illustrations. But uh, other than that. Good point, Diab. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the small things, you know, the little details. But yeah, it looks really good. Um, I is the the turning of the mercantile as it goes towards the um, the residential on Elmwood? Is that new? I don't recall seeing that before. The the the, the roof no no on Elmwood not yeah oh, Elmwood um, yeah yeah I, I just the one thing I noticed is you kind of you have that that sort of as the building folds back. Oh, one more, maybe. Yeah, see that sort of little corner where it turns around and it meets where the residential part is? Here. Is that new? This? Yeah, there's that. There, it's not a It's not a full 90 degree. You've got sort of a... No, that's, sort of that's been that this has been a part of the plan. You know? Okay. I just, for some reason, it really, it, it really, I noticed it this time. And yeah, it, no, I... Oh, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, that's a, it just... Um, but yeah, I like it. Um, and we also you. added in just a little bit more detailing around the windows and the paneling and the sort of between. Obviously, the SketchUp doesn't do justice to the transparency that would be there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Carol? Um, yeah. 
Um, I, like everyone else, so I'm very excited with the work that you and Dennis have done. I um, wanted to bring up one of the um, questions that came up in our last meeting. Um, if you were on slide 21. Okay, hold on. Yeah. That one? Yes. Okay. So um, where the balconies become very large in the two bedroom apartment on the Vine Street corner. Yeah. Um, now that all of the work has been done on the cornice, I think it really, and the soldier courses, I think it becomes really clear that that eroded corner because of the balconies really um, doesn't, it, it doesn't, um, it weakens all of the work that's been done to, to really make this a very powerful and, um, and detailed um, facade along Main Street. If you continue around the corner, I thought I would make a comment. I looked at the two bedroom units in their plan and see how this, this kind of the, a nice strong brick building is just kind of hanging at its cornice there in the upper right hand corner. That eroded corner to me doesn't have the, the the, the presence, yeah, that the that the other corner does. But then, as you as you go around onto Vine Street, one of the things that you did on Elmwood, which I really um, appreciate, is as you're transitioning to um, the other roof line, you kind of create this 45 degree um, turn or cut um, corner in the building. Yes, right there. And for me to go this transition on this side isn't as well executed as it is on the other side because you you have a balcony in that location on the other side. So as you move from the retail building yeah. to the residential, there is this, this sort of reveal. That, that's the reveal, but then the balcony right there at the other edge, no, to the right, that, that set of balconies that stack on top of each other is a nice kind of turn as you come around the building and you go from yeah. retail to residential. So I just thought that that was an opportunity that maybe just hasn't gotten developed yet because you've now changed the roof line here, but it also would help take that sort of missing tooth out of the the front of the, or the that front corner along Main Street. Yeah, there so was- I think, I think the interface I would agree between let's call it the residential scale building and the mercantile building, this, this interface where they touch. Yeah. I think we can look at that a little bit more. It's been a reveal um, due to the plan. These are bedrooms in these locations and the living spaces are sort of on the edges, but I'll, I'll look at, we'll look at that some more. And yeah. I, that's a, if you, if you go to the floor plan on the second floor, yeah. um, just, putting the balcony on the other side of the living room would mean it would face west and it would also towards the sunset and it would also face towards the residential area of, of the site rather than looking to the parking lot of the bank. And that was just something that I thought um, it, it had a benefit to it um, in terms of having a sense of being at home and well, looking I west. To the bed. I think the, our response was we wanted to not create an opening towards the neighborhood, and we were particularly being sensitive to that. And uh -huh. that's a big reason why I was very concerned about having an open deck facing the neighborhood. And, and additionally, I think that there's an urban sense here as you look down the street about how it reinforces the access of Main Street. But I, I would say the former and the latter comment for me is that I do think the detailing about how they, they interface each other is something we can continue to look at though. I do agree with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I guess, my only, um, my only comment uh, in, a, in an effort to be helpful. Thank but, you, thank you. Yeah. But well done. Um, really um, excited that the entry to the residential um, lobby is, is much more gracious and um, well thought out. Yeah.
Great, thank you very much, Cheryl. All right, so I'll wrap it up. Um, excellent. When I saw when I saw the gears lining up with the break between the windows, I was like, yes, thank you on the front elevation. It is driving me just the when the windows were crossing over the piers in the front, it was driving me nuts. So when you look at the front elevation, which there's only one picture of it that kind of shows it, I was, it was like, thank you with that and the cornice. And you made some really great uh, changes to the design that really has strengthened it. I'm going to support um, Maureen's comment on the dormers that they do need some more tweaking and some more sophistication compared to everything else, but I know you'll do that. Um, and that Cheryl's comment about the missing teeth um, kind of at that corner, it does it does feel like teeth is missing. And I the question I actually have more for the development team overall is because I was just in, um, I, I, I have a client who's in Brookline who's in a, and we were dealing with the whole condo association and that those balconies actually don't get used. Um, and they're actually having, they have problems with the um, construction of them, but, and so they're causing water issues, but they actually are not getting used there. Um, and it actually, if you push and take them out of there, they get more light because they're have the overhang. And so I just uh, the question for the development team is that it really necessary for those balconies at the corner to not emul emulate the other side. Um, and is that a financial, you know, is that a huge perk because you're actually losing your square footage inside the unit for for these balconies, which aren't really private because Main Street is very well traveled. Um, and would it be better to go and mimic the other side? Um, it's just a question I had. It's not, it's more for you to look at in terms of the financial. I would rather if you can get more square footage and it helps you to go and mimic the other side balconies than have the missing teeth. Because it does feel kind of strange with the overhang of the brick with no, nothing supporting it. Um, I'm okay with it over at the ramps because we kind of need to have it for um, ADA and uh, circulation issues. But at the balconies, it's just a question for you guys. And you can come back next week, uh, next the next time, not next week, but the following week um, um, with that. Ms. Uh, Chair, do you mind if I just make a point? About, I, the, yep. project, the projected balconies, aside from um, the detailing, which I'm confident we can handle, uh, I think when you have buildings like this, it's um, I would talk about the depth of the facade is really important to um, maintaining some human scale. And I advocate for um, that difference, those differences between the windows being set back eight to 10 inches and the balcony with a slight projection in the way people can open a door and just step. Oh, Ted, I'm talking about just the three that are on the right side. Oh, okay, not those. No, well, no, I'm just talking about the three on the right side. Is it? better to do it that way or to bring it in and actually have more square footage inside than out? Are those really gonna be used? Does that really add value? That's what I, I'd like the development team to really look at. And if it doesn't, then I would I would say pull it out and you can still have it wrapped, but pull the wall out. Um, and um, so it's just a thought for you guys to look at. Yeah, and just a comment on open space. I think in this time, particularly where, you know, more people are, working remotely and that may be a part of the lifestyles that any amount of open space that can be a part of a unit I think really helps the livability of it so I'd advocate for a, even just a little bit of we really concentrated to try to provide open space for each of the units so you know but I think to your point we'll take that comment back to our team and discuss it okay and then um the so we talked about the corner the missing teeth um a couple of things I just want to bring to the development team to make sure they are looking and uh, dealing with the timeline to address it. I would like to see the locations of those housing units um, to come. I know that you're working with um, the board that deals with that, but I would like to see where those are and I'd like that to be considered um, as part of um, uh, the what the, the planning board is looking at in terms of the permit application where those specifically are located. We have the count and everything, but where they are specifically located with that throughout, that be through it. The other issue I wanna make sure that you are very careful on is the public way is I believe um, how it's happened, uh, especially the ZBA has ran into this uh, more recently, that the select board has to um, approve any of the public way modifications um, before the planning board can approve or or deny or whatever the planning board chooses to do 
um, regarding um, re the project if the public ways are not approved by the select board. I'm not sure, Brian, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if the, the planning board can take it up for consideration um, without that because there are components of it that need that the select board's review first. Um, and then my last comment is the visibility of turning out of vine onto main is the location of that tree that would be for to have that's a new addition to make sure brian that the consultant for traffic is reviewing that location of the tree at the corner of vine and main to make sure that visibility is not impacted at all by that tree location at that corner and then if it does um, everything will have to be shifted um, to accommodate so when you come out of vine you can see um, and uh, I think that's, oh, and the tower. And a question for you um, is the tower windows is you have one window. I was actually wondering if you could actually treat it with um, high, instead of doing the one punch window, puncture window, if you actually treated it with high windows at the top of it that make it almost look like a, like a lookout tower. Um, that. Because when I looked at this side, it's, no, it's okay. On the other side, when you look at it, it has no windows. And it was like, it'd be nice if it actually read like a lookout tower. Um, since it is a tower, it's not going to go away. Um, just as something to consider. Um, but uh, otherwise, excellent job. You took um, the planning board's feedback and you really worked with it. And I look forward to uh, what you come back with on um, in two weeks. All right. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, Brian, I know that we wanted to discuss quickly the design, uh, no, I'm sorry, the contract for the historical house that was proposed. Um, the, uh, there's some discussions that need to happen around that. And um, I want to let all the public know that, yes, before we do anything, we still have to go through. Um, we had um, opportunity for public comment. However, we're still awaiting for board members ask questions and audience members to be given the opportunity to ask questions of us and or the applicant. Um, so that's uh, it's part 10 of our current hearing procedures. And so th those are occurring. Um, we're trying to make sure my, my thought process so the public is aware is to get you as much of the information so you have it. So when you have that opportunity, you have everything before you um, and not that we do it too early so that you don't have anything and um, stuff comes in afterwards and you're not given that opportunity. So I'm trying to make sure we have as much information as we can for you. So the questions and answers um, will be as much as informed as they can be. So that's where we are in the process. And I thank you for everyone who is here um, who wants to speak. We will be doing that. We are not going to forget that. Um, but it may be, it might not be the next time based on um, we don't know what's coming before us and um, with the changes and then also where the traffic consultant is at that point. So I just want to make sure the public is aware of where we stand and also my fellow members of the board where I'm going with this. Um, so Brian, do you want to talk briefly about um, the contract with uh, the historical preservation? Yeah, so um, not so much about the contract, more of just a small overview, uh, make sure everyone is aware and on the same page that SSV architecture, um, they have not been activated yet. They're going to get activated uh, um, after uh, any potential permit. And the idea is that they would be involved with uh, when the destruction uh, or rehabilitation, but part destruction of, of the L of the house, and they would be there for that. But pretty much, I just want to make it clear that all, nearly all of their work is is, has not taken place yet and will take place through the life of the project. Uh, at the moment, the most things that are related to the his historical aspect of the house are through a list of conditions that were uh, developed by Historical Commission member John Clemson, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. Um, those conditions were already part of the permit application and they've already been agreed to by the applicant. Um, so that's that consultant, just wanna make sure everyone knows that, no real questions needed, uh, or I don't have need any answers at the moment um, related to that. The other is Tool, the traffic uh, uh, engineer. So uh, they will be here you know, on the 26th. Um, we should actually be receiving their, their review uh, before the end of the week, um, most likely by Thursday of this week. Um, that will then be forwarded to everyone um, and, uh, 
uh, that's it with that consultant. Um, the other consultant that's actually not technically our consultant is the Conservation Commission's consultant, um, who is VHB, who um, reviewed their study. We're pretty much going to be relying uh, on the engineering department, and Beth now might be a very quick 30 second kind of update of where we are on uh, for them, just so everyone knows. So Beth Rudolph is a town engineer. So Beth, did you want to give us a quick update? Sure. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Great. Um, so as Brian mentioned, the um, VHB has completed the initial peer review for the Conservation Commission. Um, they do have quite a few comments. Most of them relate to the flood storage that um, Dennis actually pointed out in the cross section. Um, it's kind of a, I guess, novel solution. I can't say it's one that um, either myself or VHB have seen um, anywhere else. So basically the, the flood storage is proposed in a layer between the um, first floor elevation of the building and above the parking. Um, so there are some concerns um, about that concept in general and then also just regarding the flood storage openings. Um, so I guess, you know, moving forward, I, I think it would probably make sense um, you know, for the, the board to either engage with the commission or have VHB potentially come in to kind of highlight some of the issues um, for you once maybe they've gone through the next iteration of comments with, with the applicant. Great. Uh, thank you, Beth. Um, the um, only other thing I think I wanted to talk about related to this, and then we can, um, I'll give it back to you, Heather, was that, um, the there so the, I have been compiling all of the public feedback in emails. So there's about um, I have received um, I have received emails from seven unique um, either individuals. One of the individual um, actually represents 666 Main Street. So um, so out of those out of those seven uh, unique individuals, one of them actually is probably more like 40 individuals. Um, They're all relatively um, saying uh, the same thing um, out of these seven unique uh, people or um, comments that are related to the, the building is either too big or if it is this large, it should be stepped back. And then the other uh, comments are related to parking and traffic. Um, so it's specifically scale uh, and the setback and, and then parking and, and traffic. Um, I have an updated version today that I can send that PDF to everyone. Um, it is about 16 or 17 different emails, but again, it's only seven different people. So, uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Brian. Um, and Dennis, at the next meeting, um, if you could have a... Um, uh, if you could review um, that their comments about scale massing step back and provide um, where you stand and why you stand there, that would be very helpful. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, I think we um, are, uh, we might be at a place where we can continue and set up a time certain uh, to continue the hearing. Um, May I suggest the 26th at the same time, 8.30, only because that allows things before and after? Um, yes. Why well, I actually pause for a minute to um is because I'm trying to figure out, we have been sticking this project in between our meetings consistently. And so we have an hour here, an hour here. I am wondering if at what point do we just dedicate one meeting to it and go through as much as we can? Are we ready to do that? We still have traffic to come through and go through, or do we want to wait for one more meeting before we just kind of, I think it's, we're going to need to dedicate a meeting to this to, to continue to move it through um, the process. I so, would. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. I, I would suggest that we um, have the, I do agree. We need a large meeting. But I think we need to have all of the um, reports in so that they're available to the public for review before we have that meeting. I don't know if that changes the plans or not, but. Nope, I, 
that sounds great. So we will, we're looking to continue on the 26th at, you said Brian, 8.30? Oh, that's just what we've been doing. We, I mean, we yep. don't have, if we're gonna devote, if we're gonna devote an entire meeting, then I would say 7.30. Well, no, I think we should do it after the 26th. We should get all the information. And then the next meeting we have will be one meeting devoted just to this project that will give um, a lot of people to digest uh, the 26th meeting to then therefore come forward with their questions uh, for the planning board and the applicants uh, and then go through um, the other last remaining 10 through 14 of our hearing procedures. All right, that makes sense. So the 26th, lead, 26th leading up to the 9th. Um, yes, the 26th at 8.30 sounds good to me. Okay, so uh, to continue the hearing to a date certain, can I have a motion? I move that we move, uh, we continue this hearing to January the 26th at, was it 8.30? Yep. Okay, that's a motion. I'll second. I just want to make sure, can everyone attend that meeting? Yes. Uh, yes. Brian, do you know if Heather Hannon can, can, can attend that meeting? I believe that uh, that is a meeting that she can attend. I think from here on out, I believe all the meetings are attended by all people, okay. according to the poll. Okay, great. Um, I didn't want to leave her out. Um, there's a second. Any more discussion? Roll call vote, please. Jurious, aye. Meister, aye. Wolf, aye. Von Maring, aye. Motion passes 4 0 with Heather Hannon absent. The meeting is continued. The hearing is continued to January 26, 2021 at 8 30. Thank you so much to everyone who participated, uh, Dennis and Ted and uh, the whole team, um, and also all the staff who has been working. Um, to make all the meeting happen and get all the documents for us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on the 26th. Planning board, uh, let's move on to the next item. We are going to be going through the ZBA petitions. We have five of them to go through. Um, I do not plan to have uh, any presentations done um, or to hear from any of the applications unless the planning board is moving to recommend unfavorable action. Um, so at this time, let's start with number 3914, 138 Forest Street. Um, with that, we um, there is a letter from uh, the clerk of the ZBA saying that it is unclear if they are supposed to come back before us. Um, it was not requested of the ZBA. They are currently before the ZBA. We have reviewed this. Planning board, do you want to review this at this point or... Do you want to wait until the either the ZBA asks us to re-review it, or where would you like to go with this? There well, I just want to comment that we have a, also a memo I read from the town engineer that I think there's some pretty serious questions there. So I think we should not weigh in at this point. Was uh, Maureen, I, I did not get that letter. It was through email today. Oh, I did not read my email apparently. Thank you. Beth, do you want to give a brief overview of your email regarding this site? Um, yeah, so I I wouldn't say they're serious concerns. I think there are some technical things that need to get worked out. Um, certainly nothing that um, from an engineering standpoint would hold up the project. Um, so I believe they can all be resolved uh, through conversations. Um, I'm, I'm going to chime in from my point of view. I just there they they did some things with the engineering for the walls and stuff. It looks like they removed the pool, um, but I don't see anything changing really in great detail from our concerns. Well, Brian, I have, you have the position we took previous. This this would be the third time we're reviewing this site. I, I know, right? Yeah, exactly. um, they did remove a lot of the retaining wall in the back. I believe they pulled it back so that we don't have two retaining walls. We just have one. And so it's now there's a, a, a gradient from the back wall down to the rear. So I think they have done a, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, I think they've removed most of the, the tall, you know, six foot wall plus four foot um, fence on top. Am I right about that? 
a significant portion, but the other thing was they were, they obviously don't have a pool now. They were removing 38 trees. Now they're removing three trees. The only thing that the, um, the only thing that they did not even uh, try to, to uh, comply with the recommendation from the planning board to move the house back. So if anything, I would say that was the only thing that they, that they did not do significant positive work uh, related to. I think they did a lot of other good work, but they didn't move the house. Did, did you say they moved it? They were. We wanted them to move it back or forward. Yes, to get. It we wanted right. to move them. We we wanted to move it back because it's it's kind of an arc along that part of forest in terms of where the setback is, and it made sense the first time. And now they it's been two iterations, and we've said whoa whoa whoa, put it back to where it was, and now this is now the third or the third iteration where they still haven't listened to this. So we we've given this comment every time to ZBA, put the house back eight feet where it was, and in my mind. That is the only thing that they haven't done to, they, they haven't addressed. I believe they have addressed almost every other concern. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to be an idiot here, Brian, but when you say put it back, you mean move it further away from the street? Correct. Yes, correct. Okay. Further away. Because <laughs> I read put it back where it was. I wasn't, I, I, yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I read back in a different context. Can I, I agree. comment I think, to the ZBA? Yeah. Beg your pardon? We can certainly send a comment to the ZBA that this has not been addressed. Keep it simple. Yeah, I, I, the comment I would I would I would write to the ZBA it would be that I, I think they have done they've addressed essentially everything except for the setback, the front setback, and we do request that they move it further from the road. About was it eight feet, something like that. Yeah, what our, our concerns when we wrote previously is the width of that house um, as designed is pretty substantial compared to the abutters. Um, uh, so either you got to push it back so the width is not so imposing or you shorten the width. I think they'd rather move it back eight feet than shorten the width. So just very, very quickly. So the, the ZBA the ZBA, it's unclear how strong the ZBA feels I, that they might have been the one to request it to move it forward. But I, I think because they, from what I gathered, they were more concerned with the earthwork, less concerned with the streetscape. Right. So th I, th I think that's where the difference between planning and zoning is at the moment. Well, I think we can simply say that our preference is that it's moved further back from the street by eight feet. Um, as far as I didn't measure it, I presume the width of the house is the same. I didn't measure it, so I don't know if they addressed the width qu question. Um, and, um, and but they certainly have reduced the amount of earthworks, as you call it, in the back, which I think is a, a positive. Um, my only concern with the removal of the trees is that in their tree diagram where they indicate the tree that's going to be removed, they annotate it with the word typical. So I don't know what that means. Does that mean they can choose a tree and it's typically gonna look like that? Existing tree to be removed, typical. No, they're, they're calling out the graphic si um, symbol as being typical. Oh, okay. Any, anything with that graphic symbol is removing a tree. Okay, so they have delineated, so I don't have a, so I think that's a, that's a, those are those are positive things. We should applaud them for that. I, this is Cheryl. I mean, I think one of the things we talked about, um, and you brought it up, is that we were concerned they didn't have a a section showing us the height of retaining walls and fences and things like that at the back. They do yeah. have that now, which is um, which is very useful, and it was reduced to four feet in height for the retaining wall. I think if we if they were to move the house back based on the grade, the eight feet, they would we'd go back to a much larger retaining wall, um, if I'm not mistaken. So it's kind of one or the other. Maybe that's why um, there's been a resistance. I don't know the history of the other meetings other than the last one we had, um, and if there's been um, there was at least one before that. So. Um, that's the only thing I would say would be the consequence of, you know, sending it back with it needs to go 
um, back away from the street by eight feet. It's going to the hills. It's going to go back down the hill again. I've been informed. I've been informed that that is uh, that is the case. Uh, meaning that if they did move the house back, the wall would get bigger. I no one can say exactly how much, but that's the, that you're hitting on the the relationship between the house and the wall. It looks like it might go up if I can read this correctly. Um, about five feet, at least, which would turn the four foot wall into a a five a nine foot wall. Right. If I can, if I read this correctly, I I can't quite get the uh, horizontal scale right. But I'm not sure the horizontal that they haven't marked the horizontal scale. So yeah, I'm just going by the overall scale they have. On yeah. the, the plot, so um, yeah. So is that a question? I mean, that's a question for the board. Do we do we want them to? I don't know. Is the eight foot in front important more important than the taller wall in the back, or do we tell them that we prefer that they do the eight foot and retain the the, the new height of the wall? I I I would say we just take no action at this point. Let's move on and let the ZBA work through that. Um, we we voiced our concerns, and the ZBA either finds that it does meet or doesn't. And if it doesn't, they would recommend moving it back. I mean, they could shorten the lawn terrace. They there's a lot of options that could be done, but it's nothing we would work out in our meeting. It's not really in our. So I would okay. I say I I would like to take no action. I am and just let it go to the ZBA and let them work through everything. Right. Let's. Yeah, onward. Thank you. I'm Thank comfortable you. with that. You know, they made some good changes. Um, but is it enough? I don't know. And that needs a full evaluation, which would be the, in the ZBA's responsibility to do. Um, so with that, um, let's let's go on to number three nine two nine thirty two Lawson Road. I'm going to just keep moving. We I think we can recommend favorable action. Um, I'm trying to find it. Heather, do we are we going to spend a lot of time on each of these? No, no. I'm just waiting to make sure that uh, if Cheryl or Dia want to say anything, they can. Otherwise, I don't have a problem with this one. I don't either. Fine. Did someone want to make a recommendation? Oh, I said. I mean, a motion. That recommend favorable action. I I will second. Uh, okay, favorable action on number three nine two nine thirty two Lawson Road. All three nine two favorable. three. What? Three nine two three. Three nine two three. Uh, roll call vote, please. Jarius, aye. Meister, aye. Wolf, aye. Von Maring, aye. Motion passes four zero, with Heather Hannon absent. Number three nine two four seven Winslow Road. Um, it's Maureen. I, the one thing that's come up, and I really do want to emphasize, is the idea that even though there's, I believe it's, I don't know if it's aluminum siding, but there's some kind of siding on there um, that one would hope eventually will come off. So as a result, other boards have recommended that the um, addition um, be a wood siding, and the I believe the applicants have said that would be acceptable. So anyway, I would say favorable subject to a condition that the um, siding be um, a, a natural siding. Probably wood, I guess, so why not? Siding, be a wood side, a nat well, let's just call it wood siding. What, 3924, yeah. In anticipation of bringing, getting that, um, uh, what do you call it, the aluminum? I guess it's aluminum. I, they, I, I don't know this. I just, people have talked about that metal siding, it, getting it removed it's, eventually. It's actually stated in here that they would match the color of the existing aluminum siding. So well, they- relevant if it's wood. Yeah, I'm just saying that I, it is existing aluminum right now. So, um, which, so. Anyway, I will say recommendations from design review and I think historical picked up on it. Yeah, I will second that. 
Gerald, did you have any comments? No, I don't. I think I find that reasonable. Um, all right, let's go to a vote. Um, favorable. Um, we recommend favorable action number 39247 Winslow Road, um, uh, but the siding should be what? Uh, roll call vote, please. Jerry is aye. Um, Meister, aye. Wolf, aye. Von Maring, aye. Number 39257 Grassmere Avenue. Um, um, I'm just going to chime super, in. I, I know we're trying to go through these really quickly, and um, that's fine, but I also kind of wanted to dovetail that very quickly and introduce um, uh, the new assistant uh, town engineer. Uh, oh, yeah. who, oh, I'm who, so sorry. We're cutting you out of your job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Brian Manter um, is, uh, had just started, I believe, last week. That's um, right. And he's uh, going uh, took over for another Brian Kerrig uh, Kerrigan. Um, but we'll be doing um, the uh, most of the analyses for the special permits. So we'll be we're going to be seeing a lot more of him. Um, so I just didn't want to completely fly through all these without introducing um, Brian, uh, who comes with us comes with us from about uh, 15 years experience on the private side. Uh, so just wanted to welcome him very quickly. Um, and Seven Grassmere does um, it is a pretty large addition. There I would imagine that there's probably some uh, potential engineering uh, review that um, he might have done. So it was kind of do both. So um, so sorry for that interruption. But I was actually um, going to ask. I was actually going to ask engineering for their recommendation on Seven Grassmere. So yeah, that, that's why I thought it'd be a good time uh, to, to to move into that. So thank um, you so much. Uh, right before we get in there, I have a really important question. Is that Brian with a Y or an I? Uh, it's Brian with a Y. Yay continuity. Yes. <laughs> This is Beth. I just want to jump in and say how happy we are to have Brian with us. And um, as the old Brian did, you'll probably have alternating visits with myself and the, uh, this Brian at your meetings from week to week. So. Welcome to the community, Brian. We're glad to have you. And um, you. if you are ready, if you are the one, uh, can you give us your recommendation for 7 Grassmere Avenue? Okay. Um... Yes, so I, I believe that this uh, um, this uh, application came before for a notice of intent hearing, and at that during that time, um, there was some observations made by the depart the engineering department um, where they had not really fully addressed um, stormwater runoff and um, management. Um, so, you know, the recommendation from the engineering department. Is really in line to have the applicant address the findings that were made in the um, NOI review back on November 9, 2020. Heather, can we chime in? Uh, hold one minute. Um, can you clarify? So you said you're looking for them to meet your recommendations from when? Um, uh, no, uh, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say I can I can jump in. It's kind of unfair because Brian didn't do the original review okay. <laughs> for the notice of intent. Um, so we reviewed, um, as Brian said, the notice of intent back in November. Um, I believe there was another hearing in front of the CONCOM, although it appears the CONCOM hasn't closed their hearing. Um, we never received written comments back uh, regarding our questions. Some of them, I think, still need to be addressed. Um, so basically, we're just providing the ZBA with a copy of our comments from the NOI hearing and asking for those to be addressed as part of the ZBA review. Okay, so you, you're saying that you have not reviewed this current set of drawings? No, that's, no, that's not what I'm saying. Th this is the same set of drawings that was submitted to the Conservation Commission, and we provided comments to the Conservation Commission. Our comments were not addressed, uh, at least not to us. Maybe they addressed them verbally during the hearings, but we never received a response to our comments. So we are forwarding those same comments to the Zoning Board of Appeals so that they hopefully can be addressed as part of the ZBA review. Okay. And the issues are specifically related to the compensatory storage because it appears that they're making some grading changes in the 100-year floodplain. Um, and then also um, just 
you can see in this plan, that they appear to have the erosion controls placed on the private property to the left of them. So just, uh, you know, that's, if there's going to be a temporary construction easement or whatever, um, the plan is there. They do have a proposed infiltration system designed to uh, accommodate the increased impervious area, which appears to be sufficient. Okay, so they can they either can wait to the ZBA or they can come meet with you to discuss that. Right. Yeah. This is not. Yeah, a, I mean, I think. Yeah, it's not the. Problem. I think it's. it's not, could we just keep moving? This is really not. This is the ZBA's um, special permit. It's not ours. Sorry, but we've actually addressed the concerns. Can we can we update our permit though? Um, so uh, uh, I think that's UCM talking and uh, Chris Mulhern. I see you raising your hand as well. Um, go meet with Beth. Give a phone call to Beth and have a conversation with them. It's not something that we can address really in the middle of our meeting. Um, and typically, when we're in this situation, the planning board gives recommendations to. Um, in the past, but the board gets a all of the members. Um, we typically just recommend that um, they follow through with the engineering's recommendations. And so those can change um, anywhere to right before um, the hearing. So uh, if there's issues that need to be worked out with engineering, uh, go to engineering. It's, planning board is not the best place to work out and go through and describe all the engineering issues um, that the engineering department's concerned with. I hear you just, we have an email from Beth from November 10th saying that we had met the, uh, the compensatory storage requirements, but we'll follow back up with Beth. Okay. Um, so um, with that, um, my concern was actually with the driveway. I'm just gonna jump in to go. Um, and that I would just like to put, if we do recommend favorable, is that that be um, narrowed at the opening? I had the same exact reaction. So good, <laughs> thank you, Heather. So that's two of us independently. At the curb cut. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really mean because I know you need to come out and but I would like at the curb cut to be narrowed and more a little bit more gracious. So can we can we talk about that for a moment? I'm not, forgive me, I'm not sure how your process works. Well, usually the board gets yeah, I, I, I have a bunch of concerns, so that are bigger than the curb cut. Okay, so why don't we go through the planning board? Um, and then, like I said at the beginning, if we're going to move to unfavorable action for any reason, we'll open it up and have a discussion with the applicant. Okay, okay Deb. Uh, my biggest problem is I have no idea where the property line is. So I have no idea what the setback is. There's a proposed property line and there's an annotation on one of these things, which says that it apparently there's something which needs to be negotiated where the property line is. Um, I usually do not, I'm not in favor of, of something being that close to the property line. It's only a five foot setback in a uh, 15 foot setback zone, I believe. Brian, I really miss those tables you usually have. I, I hope that's this just was, the one off was, New Year. Yeah, this was the first one that I did not do the table, but uh, just to, yeah. to talk to your point, this um, you'll see this, it says proposed Plot line. This is a, this was as a result of an A and R that occurred in November of last year that the planning board endorsed. They have not gone through the transaction because they want to make sure that this can happen before it actually gets. So as of right now, there's an A and R on file that that is act that says that this proposed lot line is there. So although it says proposed lot line, they've actually gone through the necessary process. The transaction hasn't occurred yet, so ZBA would not be able to let this happen without a condition saying that the A&R needs to occur. So that, that, that just answers that, that question that you had. Okay, so in other words, then it is an actual five foot setback in a 15 foot setback zone. Correct. And that that is, I have a real problem with that. I understand the house on the neighboring lot is far away, but I, I just have a real problem with that. I realize this is a really hard to build on lot, Anyway, that's my that's my biggest concern, my hugest concern. Any others, Deb? Nope, that's it. Cheryl? Uh, no, I don't. I think you guys, um, I'm uh, with Deb on that one. Maureen, did you have any other comments? I know you agreed with mine, but the main thing that jumped out, uh, what that struck me is that. Um, even though, and I know I, I was just as liaison hearing the one of the other advisory board 
um, and they were also wondering about the driveway and then they were talking about using some kind of um, uh, paver to at least minimize the visual impact of the macadam but I just think it's too wide. And I know that there's um, some desire to be able to add extra cars while there's a, a, I don't know, a teenage driver in the house, but we've had teenage drivers. We have narrower driveways too. Um, you can pull over on the lawn if you have to, but this this is a, um, a garage that'll carry two cars. So then there's also a space in the front. It, it just, it doesn't need to be that much paving. It takes away from the beauty of the neighborhood. So what, even if the neighbors feel that that's okay, I think that's a small, um, request to reduce the width of the driveway. That's me. Um, so I am going to open it up to the applicants to address Cheryl and Diab's comments regarding the set line set setbacks. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, hey there, this is um, Chris Mulhern. Can I? Not yet, Chris. Um, so Diab and Cheryl, um, do you, do you have any questions or comments or that you would like answered from the applicant or rep the representative? No, I don't have any other questions. Okay, so I guess the big question before you is why do you have to have the setback just be five feet? Uh, I'm gonna let, uh, well, let me show you first uh, one slide here, if you don't mind. Um, I think Chris, you should be, be I, I just made you a co-host. You should be able to share. One second, let me see if I can get this up. Heather, um, could you establish a time for this? I just feel like I can't make it much longer. No, I agree. Um, Chris, can you do it in about three minutes? I'll Talk do my it? best. Okay, and the issue uh, that, you know, the issue at hand is the setback. And the proximity so the, the first the first issue is the setback. Uh, this this green outline shows the uh, parcel that would be transferred. It would make a 25 foot setback from the house, which, when this garage gets built, results in a five foot. Let me get this slide here. This slide here shows the the setbacks. The reason that uh, Sam and Mann would like this outcome is because it leaves the preponderance of the land in the control of 11 Grassmere, which is Drew Butero's uh, lot. And that they believe is gonna get the best result as far as keeping that landscape wide open and having the best um, views to the pond. So if I go down to this slide here, you, you can see what's happening. The fence that exists along the property line here will be taken down. The shed that's at this location will be taken down. This will free up a view from Grassmere to the water in this area. And with the preponderance of this real estate in here being in the control of number 11, uh, that means the landscaping will be maintained and the view will be maintained. Uh, rather than having another 10 feet of it be in the control of uh, Sam and Mann so that we have dueling lawnmowers uh, working on that piece of ground. I wanna go to the driveway issue uh, for one minute. This is the slide which uh, the design review committee saw comparing the existing driveway on the left to the proposed driveway on the right. The left-hand slide shows the shed being uh, demolished and the fence back here being demolished. The right-hand slide shows the new building with uh, the proposed driveway. DRC had an issue with this. We went back to our landscape architect and we made this revision here, which is reducing the blacktop, introducing a cobble edge on both sides of the drive and a cobble apron at the street as well as at the building. This uh, rendering shows the revised plan with the cobble edging and the reduced 15 foot blacktop section in the middle. I'd like to point out that, that this is this 18 foot overall width of pavement is uh, at the low end of the spectrum for this neighborhood. There are driveways in excess of 30 feet wide in this neighborhood. This is the landscape plan, which shows a planted buffer along 
the uh, left side of the proposed garage, ornamental trees in the foreground, and then the balance of the land, which is on the number 11 grass meter lot uh, as open landscape area. I think I will leave it there. Sam, do you have anything you want to throw in here? If I can quickly throw in the original plans um, to add a garage required us to create a U shape, a U shape along the property. So coming out from the side of the house and sort of wrapping around to a two car garage, I think Chris has um, an issue. The neighbors weren't keen on it. Um, and so, and it obviously had a major impact on the viewscape from Grassmere out to the water. So as we've tried to find a much less intrusive scenario, that's where we've gone to building on the driveway side of the house. Um, we've worked very closely with Drew Bataro and Gail Joe next door, who we adore, they're our neighbors, um, to try to make this as unobtrusive as possible. Uh, the reality is right now in our driveway, they look at two parked cars, our air conditioning condensers, our garbage cans, and whatever other paraphernalia the kids leave in the driveway. Um, so they're really excited about the project and hugely supportive. Um, it was Drew's request that we minimize the setback as much as possible. Um, we think five feet gives us enough where we can effectively landscape and have access to the side of that part of the property for any maintenance requirements, and yet still leave the bulk of that lawn under the control of 11 Grassmere. Um, and as, sorry, as Chris mentioned, protect that the viewscape from Grassmere over and down to the water from there. It also retains the viewscape on the other side of the house by not putting a structure in place on that side. Um, so we thought it was a great compromise, recognizing that, you know, as, as everybody works to maintain their lawns, that really leaves all the grass area with the Bataras. And, you know, we would simply maintain a, a small, shrubbery and you know kind of mulched landscaped area along the edge. Specific to the driveway, um, as Chris mentioned, the the neighbor's driveway, so Drew and Gail's driveway is 20 feet. The neighbors on the other side of us is 18 feet. Across the street from us is 35 feet. Um, around the corner is 22 feet. So an 18 foot driveway, which I think is what we're talking about, is actually on the smaller side for this neighborhood. Um, it's all fine and good to say, hey, park on this street. And, and by the way, we do not have a teenage driver right now. My kids are 15 and 13. Um, it's all fine and good to say park on this street. We have to do that now for any visitors and often for ourselves just to maneuver our vehicles in and out of the driveway. We've lost mirrors. We've been sideswiped. Um, you know, parking on the street on a good day is a challenge and causes damage. And on a snow, when there's snow, forget it. There aren't any options that allow vehicles to get past. So what we're trying to do with the driveway is make sure that it's wide enough that a visitor, Chris, if you don't mind going back to slide 23, make sure that it's wide enough that a visitor can park in the driveway and yet we'll still be able to get a car past it. Um, you know, based on the design review committee's feedback, we actually really like this idea of bordering it in the cobblestone to try to make it look better. Um, but we do have letters of support from the Bataros and actually from um, Aggie Baker, who lives across the street. So she's the one that's really most impacted by this. And she was pleased with the fact that we can actually put the cars on the, in the driveway instead of being on the street. She thinks that's a good thing, both from a safety perspective, but also from an aesthetic perspective. Okay, one I'm going to interject here because um, you're going to lose members of the board. So. Um, Brian or Beth, can you please provide the curb cut dimension that was passed by town meeting? Can we change the zoning? You it's know that 20 dimension? feet. It's 20 feet. So they're falling within. Yeah, it's 20 feet by right or whatever was existing previous. If, they, if for instance, if they had a 35 foot curb cut now, they could maintain it. And uh, well, they, technically they don't, they're making a new, new curb. Um, and Beth, did you have any concerns with the width of this driveway at this street? Um, I'll be honest, it's not something I looked at. Is it as what they're proposing within wider or um, less wide? It's 18, 18 feet. feet. 18, yeah, 18. so I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't have anything beyond what the zoning requires. Okay. Um, all right. 
Members of the board, did you get your questions answered? Are you all set? I have one last question. There are a lot of trees shown in the photographs. Um, are, the, are those closer down towards the water? Will any trees be taken out in order to establish your, your setback and, and um, the change in the property line? There, there, are, are, two, there are two trees near the, uh, near the street, which uh, are gonna be impacted by this design and they'll be replaced by two new ornamental trees uh, which are shown on this plan. This has been reviewed by conservation. The trade-offs on trees has been uh, blessed by that board. Okay, thanks. Is there a motion? Uh, well, uh, from my point of view, I move for unfavorable action primarily due to the five foot setback, which I think is too small. All right, Madam Chairman, one second here. Uh, uh, I, I wanna call your attention to article eight of the fall town meeting, which is uh, language changing the bylaw, which this board uh, sponsored. And th this is about uh, latitude on side yards to preserve natural resources and historic resources. Well, the resource isn't on this lot. Uh, the five foot setback that we're proposing here helps preserve the view corridors to Wedge Pond, which is a significant natural resource in this area. So I think that uh, Article 8, which was approved Mr. at Mulhern. town meeting. Mr. Um, Mulhern, we know the laws because we recommended a town meeting. I, I disagree with your finding. I mean, it's, it's a mowed lawn from what I gather. I haven't gone and seen it. And, and I, I disagree that this is, I don't see how this helps save that viewpoint. Because if that land is attached to the proponent, the extra 10 feet, they could also save the viewpoint. I, I don't see how where the property line is has anything to do with saving that viewpoint. I'm not convinced, which is why I don't think that exclusion applies here. Well, Dieppe, I see it as it actually protects the applicant's historical resource, the building itself, and the view sheds and the, the, the slope and as it moves to Wedge Pond. But that's my perspective. And so I see that right. they did the best thing that they could with the site and the historical resources they had around them to not but, only do their own property and also the, the steps to be found in the water. I don't, I don't understand though, Heather, if, I, if you take that property line and you move it to the left by 10 feet, how does that affect the view shed? Oh, you just move, you want the, the you want the ANR to be at a different dimension. Well, I mean, the, the ANR, the ANR was set up in order to provide a certain amount of land and the proponent has discussed how they worked with Gubataro and his, his partner, I, I don't, the, the writing's too small. I don't know her name. Yeah, um, yeah, her name. Uh, in order to ensure they worked to put this property line where it was, so that would imply there was the possibility of moving it so there would be a appropriate amount of setback. So I don't under I don't personally see how the location of the property line where it is now improves the preservation of the view shed. Because, right, because they could have, um, you're right, because what they could have done is they could have moved the property line so it falls within the setback and then put an easement on the re agreement between the two parties that they would not build or do anything. I see what you're seeing, Diab, so that they could have done it to bring it in to the setback by regulations and then just put an easement on that agreement between the property exchange and I'm still sorry, follow you, with you the can't law. build anything in that, in that, that part. And then it's that. a new and that would be completely within, we wouldn't have to have this issue. Yeah. And that's, that's just, yeah. So it's not that the garage is, it's nothing, has nothing to do with the plan layout. It has to do with the property line boundaries that they chose. That's the only issue I have. I don't have a problem with the size. I don't have the problem with the location. It's the best place on the lot for this garage. I completely agree that putting it on the other side was, what, this is a much better design. I, my only concern is that five foot setback. I and think what you're, 
I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask a question at this point. I think, Diab, that's what we struggled with is, to your point, moving that currently five foot line to the 15 foot, it's sort of somewhat an arbitrary decision of where does that line fall. Um, and, you know, the Bataras next to us want to minimize the impact to their current lawn. And so that's where we went with you know, a minimum five foot where it meets, you know, fire requirements. I think that's the setback requirement for a detached garage. Um, and to your point, it it's somewhat arbitrary where that line lands. I realize there's zoning laws that require where it lands, but um, we were trying to be respectful. I, I don't know if they're willing to do this at a 15 foot setback. And if they're not, then we go back to a much more obtrusive design on the other side of the house um, that, you know, I think will, we, by rights, we can do it, you know, and, you know, fall into the setback requirements, but it obviously, personally, I think would be much less attractive and much less desirable to the neighborhood. Um, so that's where I struggle is, how do we be respectful of the Batara's desire for the five foot setback? And yet, since, you know, it, it's but, literally going to be a line on a piece of paper and not change anything in terms of what gets constructed on the site itself. Well, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I have, but I am going to ignore the fact that you live in this house. I'm going to ignore the fact that the Pitaro live in the other house. And I'm going to think about what's going to happen when current owners are no longer there. And that person and that one decides they want to do something right next to that lot line, which they can. And all of a sudden you're going to have, I don't know, something. The next owner will have something occurring within five feet of their, of their, their, um, their property or their, their building. And so it's the next owner. I know you guys get along, but who knows what the next owners will do. And you, we've, had, we've, we've had cases where someone has tried to come in and put a road five foot from someone's house because that's where the property line was. And so it's protection for the next owners. So um, not, not to give legal advice uh, in any way, but there are ways that we have seen residents do it where they do make the property line be to meet the, the zoning and then they do it through an easement of the property. So the, the Taros or whoever lives next door to you would have full right to that land. You'd pay the taxes on it. The one thing they could never do is build within that setback because it's your setback. Um, but it's something to look into and then it would bring you uh, into compliance with the zoning is pretty much what Diab is. So if I, take, Diab, if I take your point, right? Right now the property line is the driveway. They could build within five feet of that now, which is even further over. So I'm not sure what difference it makes. Well, they can't put a building within five foot of that line because there's a 15 foot setback, but they could certainly do something obnoxious within, within that setback yeah, that would affect you. They can, put clear, they, could, they can put a detached garage. They can put a detached garage five feet or a shed uh, five feet away from the property line. But right, yeah, you can do that. Well, and, and my point is, they can do that now. It's our driveway. It would be even closer to our house than what this scenario provides. This actually gives us more cushion, so to speak. I, I think it gives your main house more cushion, but you are having. Your, your, your garage and your um, office space, and I don't know what else is going in there, is right five feet away. I, you know, I, this, the rest of the board should comment on this. I'm, I'm sucking up too much oxygen from this conversation. So this is just one member of the board. And if the rest of the board wants to, I've got a motion. I, no one has seconded it yet. So it, it may be an unpopular motion. Well, I think there are different, there are two different points. And um, the simple one certainly is the width of the driveway. Uh, there are a lot of driveways around Winchester and on this street. I have no doubt that there's some that are really wide. But I will say the road out in front of me is 18 feet wide. That's a road, and school buses go up and down that road. Um, we don't need eight, just 18 feet is pretty big, and it's just one more big, wide curb cut. And I just think it would look a lot nicer with a um, just pulling it in, I don't know, 15 feet or something, those extra few feet will just make it look a lot more attractive and really won't make much difference because cars can always pull over on a lawn um, for the time when somebody's visiting. So anyway, that's my thought. My suggestion to the board, and I think we ought to move on, 
is that we um, just um, offer some observations. We don't have to agree. Sometimes we don't, and that's okay. So I think uh, that's my proposal. Um, Deb can make a motion, and or we can make a motion that just includes the two points of concern and let the ZB, that's the ZBA's special permit, they can uh, address it. Well, technically I already made a motion. Yes, you um, did. Um, so there's a motion, is there a second? Well, no, I want, I think you're not gonna, oh, okay. Just, do you wanna just keep it as is? The procedure, is there a second? Just, just so we're clear, the motion is that it's unfavorable due to the setbacks being too small. Technically, that's the only motion that has been made. That is correct. Is there a second? Motion fails. Okay. Is there a recommend? Is there a re uh, another motion or a recommendation of how to proceed? So uh, my recommendation was to um, advise the zoning board that there were uh, two members of the board who had particular concerns um, or what objections uh, to the um, the five foot setback, and there were other members who I don't know if this is true. Um, other members who raised concerns about the width of the um, driveway, thinking the driveway width could be reduced. Uh, the driveway width just at the curb cut. So okay, I see it being narrowed at the curb cut and then widening it back up okay, after. Okay. It'd be more gracious of a... I would support that. Can, can you clarify for me, is the current zoning law that up to a 20-foot curb cut is allowed? Yes. Yes. So even though we are well within that, you want it to be smaller. The board always loves to have smaller curb cuts. I appreciate that, but and so I'm that's why the board is saying hard to think it's sideswiped again. Uh, well, it's the ZBA will rule, but it's our opinion that we love small curb cuts. <laughs> but it's, so usually they start they start in a little narrower and then they widen up right away. So the it it also helps with the flow of water too. You have a big slope going downwards, it'll stop a lot of that water from coming down towards your garage. It actually helps the flow of the water get down the street versus down into your garage. Um which you probably want to catch basin at. Um yeah there is one. Uh yeah I see it there now when I look uh, so uh, the, the motion says advise the ZBA that two members had objections to the five foot setback and other members raised concerns about the width of the curb cut. Correct. Heather, why who is the call second it? member who objects to the setback? I actually, this is Cheryl. I was concerned about the setback, but I, I don't object to it. So it, I felt the, um, the explanation um, was adequate. I don't have I, any questions. I thought the two. Objections. One member, one member of the board had objections to the five foot setback. Okay, and so I'm amending my motion. So it's one member objects to the side yard setback of five feet, and other members, and I, we don't have to number it, um, are hoping, um, asking that the curb cut be reduced. Okay, that's what I got. One member of the board objects to the Heather, five foot setback. Is there a second? I will second that. Um, any comments? <laughs> well, vote, please. Jury, yes, aye. Um, Meister, aye. Full aye. Unmarrying, aye. Motion passes 4 0 with Hannon absent. All right, moving Thank on. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for Thank your you. time. Thank you. Moving on um, to number 3926, 49 Church Street. Before we move on to this one, I do need to recuse myself off 49 Church Street. Um, if the board is going to adjourn thereafter, immediately thereafter, um, I will um, remove myself for the rest of the meeting. If not, I will wait until I get called back. We have um, minutes, and frankly, I can't make it in much longer. So I guess uh, we can do yeah. Oh my goodness, it's it's 1025. I think we should just do this and then adjourn. I think we adjourn and we come back to the meeting and I need to make sure that we put the meeting minutes first um, at our next meeting. Thank you. Yeah, we, have a, we have a lot, we have all of October, all of November and some of December. So there's a lot of meetings. Uh, yeah, that so we let's need to allocate a big for. chunk of time at the beginning of our next meeting. Uh, okay. Before the 830 hearing to go through all those meeting minutes and get them uh, submitted. And at that, then um, the planning board um, 
when you're ready after you're done reviewing 59 church, um, you can adjourn then and I will not return back to the meeting. Okay, so you're yeah. off the hook, but I'm going to say to Diab, there are all of three of us here. I cannot go past 1030. So we're going no, I, don't, I, don't, I think this is a short one, to be honest. So but, you need to make it clear what expectations are for anyone who wants to present. Well, let me first say, uh, Heather, thank you for leading the meeting. This is Diab Jarius, who is clerk. Uh, I'm going to take over the meeting from now. We are now looking at session 3926. This is a property, uh, this is 49 Church Street. This is a um, an appeal of a determination by the um, Zoning Enforcement Building Commissioner. Um, I think that um, I, I'm going to go along with, in this case, uh, yeah, I'll go along with Heather's original statement that if we if we find, if we want to deny this, then we should ask for opening from comments from the um, audience. If not, then we should just keep it to the board. Um, Brian, do you want to lead off on this? I think we can do this really quickly. Um, sure, I'll go, uh, I'll go as quick as I can. Um, so this has to do with a property that's currently a dental office. Um, it's been designated mixed use, um, or the, the, the property has been designated mixed use for a number of years, um, and the appeal is based upon specifically site plan review, amongst other things, but the main thing is that uh, they're requesting that site plan review is necessary because there's been a grade change of 6% or more um, over 500 square feet. And in addition to that, there are other uh, improvements that the appellate has said that um, that um, make the the building to act and be a fully commercial building rather than a commercial and residential building. Um, I recommended that um, the course of action that was going to happen, which was that a registered land surveyor was going to be hired in order to determine um, what what the percentage of grade change actually happened. So um, that was all the uh, information that I um, that I gave to the board was that I believe a registered land surveyor should have been should be um, impl should be used to to determine the um, whether or not they had to go through site plan review. I think based upon the photos, um, you could you can make a guess that it probably is necessary just looking at the photos. Uh, you don't have to be an RLS to figure that out, but you do need to get that RLS in order to kind of move this forward. Um, outside of that, all the other things that they, that are talked about are all in relation to site plan review that quote should have occurred. So there's I'm not really going to talk about that at the moment. It's it's more of um, it, it's possible that site plan review would have been necessary, and there are a number of things that would have not have occurred on the property had it gone through site plan review. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Thanks. That's a good good summary. I mean, I from my point of view, looking at this, I want to look at. Um, uh, several of the claims we can't really deal with right now. Um, the whether or not it's com it's there is it's completely residential or not. That's not something we actually can validate or verify. So um, I don't know where to go with that. I don't. So I do think we need to say it should be verified. I agree. I agree. So I think that we have a. It needs to be verified, but there we can't make a comment on that because we don't have any evidence. No, but we can comment. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. I'm just going through a checklist of what we can actually make a yay or nay decision on. Oh, um, we're, not the, we're not the ZBA. The no, but if we're going to make a recommendation for or against this, or are we going to make a recommendation as in these are the things we need that I think that require more information? So I guess that's where I'm trying to understand. Is the board going to say, yes, we we endorse this appeal, or is the board going to say there are there is in, the, the more information needs to be provided in order to move forward? Well, I think other I know design review said that they believe that it needs to come back for site plan review, and there were other things that certainly would be picked up by the grade change. But even so, it needs site plan review. The trees, the um, uh, what the sign, that thing is a sign, it should be removed. Um, they're just, uh, they're, and then but, the lighting, all of that should be addressed. Well, I, but, I, I but, don't know how you want to phrase it. 
I don't know how you want to phrase it, but the removal of the trees doesn't it doesn't trigger site plan review. Right. right. It's the uh, change in grade that did. The only thing that would be is change in grade. Okay. If they if they're going to turn that thing in front of there into some sort of modern architecture or modern sculpture, then there's nothing we can do about it. If it's not deemed to be a sign, then as ugly as it is, there's 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 nothing we there's nothing that anyone can do about it. So I think the only thing that we can say is that if that we need to get a land surveyor, as Brian said, someone has to verify whether or not the second floor is being used as office space. And I don't know who does that. And I think those are the only two things we can comment on. Okay, I'll, su I'll suggest that that's our motion. Uh, that Sorry to interrupt, but that would also be my suggestion. These are the two, and the notes I have here, here are residential use should be verified. Uh, so is it not being used as part of the commercial unit? And then the other was an RLS should be hired to determine the need for site plan review. That sounds good. So move. So, and I, I can't second it. Should Cheryl, you there? Let's go. To, well, let's go. I'll second that. Sure. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, please. Um, Can I uh, make a comment? No. Uh, no, I'm, I don't know who's on the line. This is Larry Murray. I'm an attorney, Murray and Quill in Winchester. No, the, the applicants also are here. We're trying to wrap up our I, meeting. I, I, I think that as far as this board is concerned, I don't know that we, we, we're not saying anything against this. We don't have the information we need. And this is the information that's required. And so I really don't know that we need to go any further into this. Yeah, you have a motion. I really am going to leave in a sec. And then you yeah, yeah. there is a motion. And, and I'd like to have a roll call vote because we are in the middle of taking a roll call vote. Rule five. Um, Meister I, Wolf I, Jarius I. Okay, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Uh, yeah, the only thing I would say before we adjourn is um, Brian, did you get my note about um, 3923 in the chat? Yes, it was reversed of the first and the second. I got it. Okay. Um, do I have a, a second for the adjournment? Cheryl seconds that. And uh, do we need a roll call vote? <laughs> Not really. Good night. Oh, Thank really. you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Wincam. Thank you, Brian. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.